It's a beautiful piece of music, but I'm sorry to say that's probably the last time you're going to hear that particular tune because as much as I love it, it got used about six or seven years ago by the US Tennis Association in one of their promo videos. And somehow YouTube has gotten the idea that they own that music. And every single week when I use that music, I end up in a copyright dispute with YouTube, which is not exactly how I like to spend my time. So we're going to have to say goodbye to that beautiful piece of music. And I'm going to have to find something else that hopefully other people haven't uh, already used and in the mind of YouTube at the very least copyrighted. So farewell to that particular piece of music. This week is a huge week. This slow chat is a fantastic way to kick off what is going to be an epic week for me. I've got Captain Graham Hood, uh, Captain my captain. Uh, he probably gets that all the time. Uh, the people's captain, the people's pilot, whatever you want to call him. Uh, I'm super excited and really, really looking forward to chatting with Graham. But there's a couple of things to cover off before we get there. Number one, filming for the documentary Battleground Melbourne starts on Wednesday. I've got a chocker block week from Wednesday to Sunday from dawn till dusk, interviewing people on that incredible set that we built. Tomorrow, we will be lighting that set and I will upload pictures to all my socials of what that set looks like once we finish all the lighting and the work. That's where the magic really happens. Cannot wait to share that with you. And then as we do the interviews, I'll be sharing snippets with you over the coming weeks while we edit the documentary with a target launch date of the 20th of December. So keep an eye out for that. The other big thing that just happened, you'll see it all over my socials, is these shirts that uh, I've been testing this one for the last week. It's currently looking a bit worse for wear and wrinkle because it just came out of the washing machine. It is actually still wet. Uh, I've been wearing it and washing it and wearing it and washing it just to make sure that this print was going to hold up and the quality was as good as I expect it to be. Uh, the good news is it's been fantastic and uh, there's no signs of wear yet. I mean, it's only been a couple of washes, obviously, but it's not like the print is just coming off or it's lost its shape or anything like that. So these are now available along with the other designs that I've been working on. They're all available from my uh, online store, which is a weird thing to say because I've never had that before until today. And uh, I will grab the link for you a little bit later on and chuck it into the chat, but you can find that on all my socials. Uh, it's the aussiebot.com forward slash Topher Field or something like that. You'll find that there. And thank you to Brad at AussieBot. You are a trooper and you've done an amazing job on uh, setting all that up, setting up the website, the e-commerce, all that stuff so that people can finally get those. Also, Brad has set aside a bunch of time on the machines tomorrow to print any orders that come in for these shirts overnight tonight. That way he can get them in the mail tomorrow and you might even have them if you happen to be going for a walk to perhaps a protest on the weekend. On Saturday, for example, if you order tonight, there's a good chance you'll actually have the shirts by Friday. I can't promise it because it's in the hands of Australia Post, but that is what we've tried to organize for you. So if that's of interest to you, uh, find the link on my Facebook page, on my Instagram, on my Telegram uh yeah everywhere and click that link order tonight and there's a good chance you'll have that by friday okay i think that's all the rubbish out of the way i think that's oh no there's one more piece of rubbish that we need to deal with because people always ask tonight i'm smoking a rocky patel 1979 that is a genuine 42 year old rapper on this cigar it's a cameroon wrapper harvested in 1979 older than me absolutely beautiful cigar and i will be pairing that with a lovely and relatively inexpensive because it's on special everywhere at the moment. Dimple 15 blend. It is a blend. It's not a single malt. But you know what? It goes all right. So we've dealt with all the questions. Uh, I don't have Marcus with me tonight, so I'm going to have to do my own comments, which is why there's been no comments yet. So please bear with me. There's going to be less comments tonight than there are normally because Marcus uh, wasn't able to join me at such short notice. So now I think I've got through everything. Goodness me, that was a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, without any more nonsense from me, would you please welcome... Captain Graham Hood, how are you? I'm great, mate. It's really good to be talking to you. And I'm drinking a beautiful uh, Urbanville blend uh, rainwater. There it is. It's a beautiful, okay. beautiful drop. And I'm eating uh, a very beautiful popcorn coated in honey that my wife has just cracked a four-year-old packet open for me for tonight's um, <laughs> chat. Uh, yeah, you, really good. You, You've broken out the popcorn. You're uh, you're um, definitely like that's that's high praise. Breaking out the popcorn for my show. I feel I feel really honoured actually. Um, now there's as soon as I said I was interviewing a pilot, everyone of course knew who I was talking about. But I was inundated with requests from people who absolutely need to get to the bottom of one of the most important questions of our time. And uh, I am known for my hard-hitting questions to my interviewees, uh, uncompromising, straight to the point. And uh, that's what I'm going to do with you, mate. So brace yourself. <clears throat> Are you ready? I'm ready. 
how much do they pay you to release the chemtrails? Um, <laughs> the same pe- the same people who organised the contract with um, with uh, Pfizer and the Australian government uh, have managed the contract to do with chemtrails. Mm-hmm. So sadly, everything that I can tell you has been completely redacted, and um, I'm sorry I can't answer that question. You you could tell me, but then you'd have to kill me. I wouldn't, but somebody else would. Yeah, somebody would. Oh, that is a crying shame. You know, that's. I just. I thought we were finally. I thought Alex Jones was finally going to have an answer to the most important question of our time, <laughs> with the possible exception of whether or not the Queen is a shape shifting lizard person. But I guess we're just going to have to leave all of those to one side. Uh, <laughs> and yes. For those that love to nitpick my work, that was a joke, okay? That was a joke. Yeah, relax. Oh, we, oh you weren't serious. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I could have given you it I might have given been a, you your answer. <laughs> might have been a bad joke, but it was an attempted joke. So relax, everybody. Okay, Graham, you absolutely rocketed onto the scene when you made that video announcing essentially that you were retiring uh, due to the COVID mandates and, and so forth. And you know, I've seen I've been in political commentary for twelve years, and I've seen lots of people do a viral video, and they come and they go, and, and that's fine. You know, everyone if 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 a video goes viral, it's usually for good reason, so good for them. But there was immediately, as I watched your video and I reposted it along with so many other people, there was immediately it was very obvious to me that there was an awful lot more depth to you, and I think that's partly a product of of years. Um, But also, over the years, you've become someone who clearly, to me, thinks about things very, very deeply. And you you are very in touch, and and this is just my opinion, but you seem to be very in touch with your moral compass. Tell me about the why of why you actually decided to go public. It's one thing to decide to do what you did. Why go public with it? Um, You know, aviation is a specialised field that is established on the dreams of little boys and girls who want to fly, right? Um, And I work, I used to work in a magnificent airline that was staffed by professionals who came into it from that dream foundation of a small child, mostly. I had uh, 32 years in command in Qantas. I had 53 years total uh, flying from the first day that I got my student pilot's licence, just before wow. my 16th birthday. Um, wow. And I was attending a lot of Zoom meetings for a lot of younger pilots and cabin crew who were decimated that they were being compromised in such a way by a company yeah, and a society that just doesn't seem to be applying an awful lot of rational thinking to its uh, mandates. And I realised that I was the old guy on the block and um, Mm. financially I needed to keep working for another couple of years Um, because we, um, you know, Michelle and I came together 15 years ago and we lost a lot of money in in coming together out of previous relationships and everything. Anyway, that's... But um, when I looked at these these kids, if you like, I call them the kids and and they're calling me Pop and all that sort of stuff, I (laughs) realised that somebody had to speak for these guys. And if mm-hmm. I had to sacrifice the next couple of years to do that, then the, it pretty much the buck stopped with me. Yeah. And um, I decided to be their voice. And uh, and I'll continue to be their voice because they deserve it. I appreciate their their um, their their dream is not yet fulfilled. A lot of them are only halfway through their career. Some have only just started yeah. it. Yeah. You know what? It's just not fair. So for it's just not fair that the CEO of Qantas uh, decides and says on mainstream media that anyone who decides not to be vaccinated is making a decision against an aviation career. Now that just yeah. that is a man who is out of touch with his with his pilots and his crews. Well, not just out of touch, but even if that is what the pilots and crews wanted, does that mean that he has the power to mandate it? See, this is we're we're hitting really interesting territory here, where we're having to think through. I think for the first time, largely in this country what the limits of people's authority actually is. You know, we accept, for example, that an employer can mandate a uniform, but when the employee walks out, they can take the uniform off. Can an employer mandate something that you cannot take off? Once once you have that vaccine, you you can't unhave the vaccine. Is it within an employer's authority to mandate that? And that, to me, is an interesting question. As, As a libertarian, I tend to come at it with the view of, 
anyone can mandate just about anything they want, but they have to then experience the consequences. If people walk off the job, if if customers don't want to come, that sort of thing, then then you know that's just that's on them, more for them. Um, but but I'm having to think through a little bit more deeply and and perhaps not be quite as glib with the thought of well anyone can ask for anything they want or set whatever conditions they want. You know there are limits to a government's authority. There are limits to an employer's authority. And I think we are we're having to think through these things. And I don't have the answers. But is how do I even put this? Is it within, in your opinion, is it within the the industry's authority to even make these mandates, putting aside what they are? Is is mandating any kind of a vaccine something that you think is inside the authority of an employer? Um, I, I think mandating an experimental vaccine is not within their authority. Um, you know, okay. yep. we I remember I remember having to have smallpox vaccination to go overseas in the seventies. Yeah, um, and that that was fair and reasonable. But I also assumed that I could go to a country riddled with smallpox, having had that vaccine, and know that I was going to be safe from catching it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this thing, this thing is not that has not been determined. In fact, we're seeing people um, catching it and uh, getting sick from it who have had yeah. the jab. Yeah. Um, the the environment that pilots and cabin crew work in is a high altitude environment, which is a thrombotic mm-hmm. environment, mm-hmm. and. And the fact that we um, that nothing has been done to test the effects of this at high altitude or with high altitude people, the fact that 16 questions that were posed to the Civil Aviation Safety Authority and the company doctors mm. to answer about long-term safety effects, short-term safety effects, um, high altitude safety effects, um, will this impact my ability to hold a class one instrument rating or class one medical, which I have to sit a physical for with an ECG every year. In my case, it was every six months because I was over 60. Yep. None of those questions could be answered. And the reason they weren't being answered was because nobody knows the answers to them. So when people criticise me, you know, I've had people who might drive a bus for a living say, mm. why, on earth haven't you, why on earth haven't you had the vaccine? Uh, I've had it and it hasn't affected me. Well, I say to them, when's the last time you drove your bus at 38,000 feet? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have a right to I have a right to make a decision based on the information that gives me the ability to make an informed consent, and that doesn't happen. But getting back to the core of your question, Tafer, is yeah. this: when the government of the day cannot mandate a medical procedure because the constitution doesn't allow it, how is it that a corporation that functions under the auspices of that government? can do the government's dirty work and impose those mandates on staff, Mm. which are policies. They're not laws, they're policies. Yeah. We need to be asking that question, and that question leads to a logical conclusion for me, which is very simple. We turn Parliament House in Canberra into an Airbnb and make some money out of it. We sack all of the politicians, and the Australian people vote on the... (laughs) The Australian, oh mate, you do this with class. The Australian people <laughs> vote on the CEOs and the board members of these corporations because they're the ones who are really running the country. Yeah, yeah. It's, look, it's a good point. There is a real tail wagging the dog kind of thing going on here, but it's it, it is a bit more complicated than that. Scott Morrison has made it very clear that he would love to mandate the jab. But he can't. And he's quite proud of the fact that he introduced no jab, no play as the health minister, federal health minister, when he brought that in 10 odd years ago. He's very proud of his track record. And he's actually said in in answering questions, he said, look at my track record. You can see what I would like to do. But he acknowledges that the federal government doesn't have the power. So he's basically leaned on the states to do it. The states, I think, have looked at it and gone, this is a hot potato. And if we do this, we're, we're opening ourselves up to all kinds of trouble down the line. So we'll lean on the employers. So now the employers are carrying all of the liability and they're the ones with all of the enforcement risk and and having to actually do the enforcing and then at risk of being fined if they fail to enforce correctly. There is a real gutlessness around the way. I mean, this isn't what leadership looks like, but I guess you could say that about the entire response to COVID. Let's let's rewind a little bit. You're in, you are closer, I don't want to offend you, but you're closer to the demographic that is at high risk from COVID than what I am. Mm-hmm. What were your thoughts early on when when it first sort of hit the news and we didn't have a lot of information? Were you worried? Yep. Were you? Yep. Yeah, I I um I remember uh, flying during the period when uh, the the uh, pandemic was 
rearing its ugly head. And Qantas was saying that they were probably going to have to stand staff down and, and curtail flights. And you could see why people just weren't traveling. Yeah. And I remember uh, what I, I was flying an aircraft from uh, Sydney to Brisbane, the last flight of the night out of Sydney. And I had a full complement of passengers and crew on board. And I had this gut feeling as I was descending with the lights of Brisbane in front of me that this may well be the last time I actually do this. Wow. So I made a farewell address to my passengers. Uh, it was heartfelt. I told them that it was an absolute privilege to be of service to them for the last 32 years in Qantas, that um, I valued the fact that I'd carried 6 million of them over 12 million miles and that I never left anyone up there yet. I hadn't injured anybody that I knew of. Mm -hmm. And that that uh, it was a great honour to fly for such a great company and please pray that we'll all be back. And uh, mm. it was it was a heartwarming moment. And when my co-pilot got off the aeroplane that night, the aeroplane was in darkness, the cabin crew had walked off, all the passengers were off, and he said, are you coming along, Graham? And I said, mate, I just need to sit here in the flight deck for a little bit longer and just ponder a few things. And um, I got up out of my seat about 15 minutes after he left, and the, the terminal was almost in darkness. The aeroplane was blacked out, all the power had been turned off. And there was just a light from the tarmac lights coming through the windscreen of the aircraft, illuminating what was there. And I paused and had a look, and I had a gut feeling that it may be the last time I would ever see that view again. Then I went into a self-imposed um, uh, stand down, if you like. I, I just had just finished paying off my last mortgage, the, the last of my mortgage. Mm. And I realised there were a lot of young guys out there who needed to fly, who were paying for their kids' education and all that sort of stuff, and I, they needed to work. So I rang the boss and I said, look, I'll lay low on stand yeah. down until this dust settles because my wife's an asthmatic and I'm a bit concerned. I don't want to go bringing anything home to her. Um, sure. And, and it was a, a palpable thought for me, mm. and I took it seriously. And then... Um, I thought to myself, well, okay, if I'm going to do that, we need to look at cures and all that sort of thing. And I looked at the vaccine and I was saying to my wife, don't worry, honey, soon a vaccine will be uh, developed and, and we'll all be okay, you know. Yeah. And then they rang, a nursing home rang and said, oh, look, um, we, your mum, uh, we need to put her on, on, uh, on, on the vaccine and uh, we've got Pfizer available for her. Are you happy with that? And I said, yeah, you better give her Pfizer. So she had her Pfizer. And then uh, AstraZeneca was being churned around as being a, a, a disaster one minute and a saving grace the next. The policy around AstraZeneca was disgustingly shifted from one day to the next. I mean, how they could imagine anyone would have confidence in their decision-making based After on that. that. Yeah. An absolute disaster. So I made it clear to my manager that I wasn't going to have AstraZeneca and I was too old to get Pfizer. And he said, well, we can get an exemption for you to get Pfizer because you're an essential worker. And I said, all right, well, when there's a clinic at the airport, put me down for that <laughs> and, um, and I'll roll with that. Um, and so then I thought, well, hang on, I better check and see what's in this stuff before I agree with it. And that, of course, opened the can of worms. And I just went to mainstream media for a start. And then when I realised that I could smell a rat in the cheese factory, I then went to... Uh, uh, Google to look at cures for COVID. Is there a cure for this thing? And I, the first thing I stumbled over was Peter McCullough and um, and then uh, Vladimir Zelenko. And I saw that their yeah. success rates for dealing with this, for less than the cost of a McDonald's Happy Meal, they were curing thousands of people that weren't even going to hospital. Yeah. And I thought, okay, so what we'll do is we'll equip ourselves with all these remedies. Mm -hmm. And back then we were able to, and we did. Yeah. And, and uh, if anything happens, then my wife and I live semi-isolated on a little 17-acre block in northwestern New South Wales anyway. We're, we're growing our own food and we're living a healthy life. And we'll, we'll work on our immune system because it, I believe that – I don't really think bugs are getting stronger. I think our immune systems are getting weaker because we smoke mm. too many cigars and drink too much dimple. And, hey, um, hey, 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 listen, listen. Multiple studies have been done on the effect of smoking on COVID-19 and found a negative correlation. In other words, smokers are less likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19 than non-smokers. That's probably yeah, the that only is. thing it's got going for it, but it's got that going for it. Well, the reason that that is the case is because they're more likely to die from lung cancer than from COVID. So. Quite quite probably, yes. I, I, I don't disagree. And the dimple is a wonderful anesthetic, I'm sure, for, um, for, for dealing with that illness. Anyhow. Hey, it, it keeps my liver in very good shape. I'm sure it does. Well, at least it works my liver out. That, that, that we can say for sure. 
yeah, very good, very good. Mm. So um, anyway, um, we, we just took all the necessary precautions, and we yeah. still do. I mean, we're not we're not stupid. Uh, we don't we don't go out. You know, we don't go running. We don't go driving down to Sydney to run around and. But I, I have to say, I've got friends who've got family who've just come back from Sweden who worked and lived over there for a few years. And they all said that uh, they treated COVID very different, differently in Sweden. Isn't it wonderful how the Scandinavians live life? I mean, I just love the way they live life. Um, when somebody got COVID over there, they used to invite them to a party. They used to have COVID parties so everyone yeah. would get infected. Yeah. And so they would develop their natural immune system. Uh, because they they actually read the stats and they believed the 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 reality of what was being offered, which was that you are uh, your chances of dying were 004 uh, percent or whatever, and and um, that ultimately for most people who didn't have underlying conditions, that this would be like a bad flu, and they'd rather get it and have their immune system, and they'd be fine. Yeah, that's 100%. supported by medical evidence all around the world from doctors who aren't under the thumb of Pfizer or the uh, major drug companies or aren't in, the, in cahoots with anyone else. It was all about sense, and it still is, common sense, applying common sense, mm. um, and um, and then going, getting on about life. So the, 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 Sw the Swedes really did the world a favour uh, by becoming the control group without using lockdowns and, and that sort of thing. Um, my, the very first video I released on this, which I think was on the 31st of March in 2020, was a video where I said, I volunteer to be infected with the coronavirus. Uh, and I meant it back then, and I I I, I would still do it now, uh, knowing all of what we've learned in the in the year and a half since. I would I still absolutely do it now in a heartbeat because it's very very clear that people like myself, despite the fact that yeah, okay, I'm a little bit fat. I'm not as I'm 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 not I'm I can't say I'm not half the man I used to be. I'm I'm twice the man I used to be, um, you know. And and that is a risk factor. But even taking that into account, according to the detailed data released by Sweden, which we had in March. Um, I'm still at extremely low risk. And I did the numbers compared to deaths per kilometre travelled in Australia on the roads. And I, I worked out that it was roughly equivalent to me driving from Melbourne to Brisbane. That was my individual risk at my age with no other comorbidities but carrying too much weight. Okay, that was roughly my risk profile. And I thought, well, I've done that drive a bunch of times. And yeah, okay, the thought crosses your mind. I might have a crash, I, you know, and you take precautions, you drive sensibly, you wear your seatbelt, but you don't sell the car and lock yourself away in your house for fear of the risk of dying on a drive from Melbourne to Brisbane. And if I'm not going to live like that when it comes to the my risk on the road, I shouldn't live like that when it comes to my risk with, with COVID. And all that's happened since and everything that we've learned since and all of what's happened in whether it's Florida, whether it's Sweden, whether it's other parts of the world, have only reinforced that what we knew in March 2020 was correct. Uh, you know, yes, there was a case for protecting the vulnerable, but there was also a case for making sure that the less vulnerable actually got the disease, recovered, and built that herd immunity that we've we've been chasing with these these jabs. Mm -hmm. So, from your point of view, in all of what you said, your primary concern early on was more about your fellow pilots, and you didn't seem to be massively afraid of the virus even before you did all that research. There wasn't a big fear in no. that for no. you. Um, is, is that just years and perspective giving you that? Is that, what would you put that down to? Because there was a massive fear campaign in the media. Yeah, well, I, I looked at it akin to shark attacks and lightning strikes. I mean, when I looked at the statistics, even those statistics that were being published when we were talking about, remember when we used to say we're going to take two weeks to flatten the curve? Yes. Um, and yeah, we were seeing <laughs> images of people dying in India and we were seeing images of people dying in, in uh, Italy and, and those things were very hard. Hmm. But at the end of the day, when we look at the overall death rate, nothing supports the level of fear that's being put out there now. Yeah. Um, I saw a study not long ago where it said that if the global if the global speed limit on the road was reduced to 50 kilometres an hour, you'd save a million lives a year. But how many people watching this and and or who are watching uh, the block or my kitchen stinks on reality TV ah. at the moment yes. would be would actually be prepared to say, yeah, I'm happy to save a million lives. I'll, I'll spend my whole life driving at 50 kilometres an hour. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Well, no. They wouldn't do it. And, and people, it. people get upset and they say, oh, but you can't compare an infectious disease with the road toll. Well, actually, yes, you can. Have a guess at the road toll, the all-time road toll in Australia. How many people have died on our roads? Oh. Just have, have a random guess. Uh, this year so far? No, 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 no. no. In total? It's since 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 cars came to Australia, how many people have been killed on the road? Oh, 
I wouldn't look. I remember when I was a kid, uh, Topher, that every weekend in Sydney there were a ten to twelve deaths on the road mm-hmm. every every mm-hmm. weekend. Yep. It was carnage. No seatbelts, you know, dodgy steering, dodgy brakes. Yeah, oh, no. I wouldn't have a clue. So I looked it up a little while ago, only a couple of months ago, and I believe this year we're going to tick over two hundred thousand people killed mm-hmm. on the roads. Right yeah. now, that's a huge number, and yes, that's happened over a hundred years, but that's a massive number of people that have been killed. And so I think it is directly comparable to an infectious disease like COVID that has a very high survival rate. I think it is directly comparable. And yeah. with the road toll, we take sensible measures to, to get, you know, keep the idiots in check and, and to improve the safety of the cars and the design of the roads and so forth. I wouldn't want to drive a 50-year-old car. Uh, I have actually driven a 50-year-old car and it feels like the death trap that it is, right? We've, we've, we've improved since then. Um, but we didn't take that approach with COVID. We took almost this zero risk approach. The, what have you seen? Because you're in a very different part of Australia to me. I'm in Melbourne, Victoria. You're in more of a rural New South Wales type of setting. What is some of what you've seen in terms of the collateral damage that's been done with the policies used up there, which haven't been as extreme as down here? But, but these policies, they're not free. It's not as though we're saving lives and it's costing us nothing. What have you sort of seen around where you are? Well, the worst thing for us, uh, Topher, is, is that we live in the border bubble and we rely a lot on crossing the border into Queensland. Mm. And Princess uh, Palaszczuk has um, has an ego that's thriving on the fact that she, underneath her, her uh, business attire, there is a Wonder Woman costume mm-hmm. and she's saving Queenslanders. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's allowing them to have the NRL play there and she's allowing 50,000 people to attend a stadium and... NRL's players, wives and kids to fly in on chartered jets and VIPs mm-hmm. to fly in and do their thing. And and she can go to Japan, of course. She can go to Japan. But someone who was trying to get across the border for cancer treatment can't get across. Mm. Um, we've heard some horror stories. And one that affected us recently here, lovely people near us, a business owner and his wife, uh, her father passed away. Uh, before he passed away, he was sent up to Brisbane to hospital. He became incredibly ill, terminally ill up in Brisbane. Mm. She and the family were not allowed to visit him. He died alone and they wanted to bring the body back for burial and uh, the health department in Queensland said the body couldn't be brought across the border unless it was first cremated. So he was cremated alone and the ashes were sent back in a jar for the family to have a service back here. Now, in God's name, and I say that with all reverence because Mm. of my love for God, in God's name, where is the humanity? Where is the humanity? Where is the humanity that denies a father the right to cross the border to be with his little son who's got leukemia in hospital? Where is the humanity? Mm. I mean, we, you know, this is a really lighthearted conversation, but this stuff really gets my blood boiling. And we go into lockdown in areas like Lismore. Lismore goes into lockdown because one guy gets COVID and businesses are shut down and everyone's living in fear. Um, the, the side effects, the isolation and the mental health uh, that that's brought about is just yeah. mind-boggling, whether you live in Melbourne or whether you live in country New South Wales. I, I must admit, uh, being locked down on a 17-acre farm with lots of things to keep you occupied is is pretty cruisy. But, there are a lot, you know, I, I feel for my friends who live in apartments in, in, in Melbourne. Yeah. I mean, goodness sake. And a friend told me today, that I was exaggerating the suicide rates because he's seen figures that says the suicide rates have actually gone down uh, in Australia since COVID came. Now, there is no logic to support that. When no. you lock down an entire city for more than 230 days and you limit people and you have them afraid of the police and you have them afraid of everything in life mm. and you're introducing them to a dictatorship that they're not being used to unless they've escaped from one in Eastern Europe, Yep. What on earth would have you think that the suicide rate could possibly go down? And I'm yeah. telling him about all the people who have been reaching out to us, screaming for help. I mean, yeah. desperate help because they're fearful of wanting to kill their children and themselves because yeah. they can't bear Daniel Andrews's policies anymore. Yeah. How can he sit there and say, well, how do you know that's true? Because the facts yeah. don't line up. Well, some facts I've seen said the suicide rate's gone up 65%. I well, know of me, people who lost their teenagers. So I, I I have someone that I'm interviewing on um, on the documentary when we filmed this week 
who uh, attempted to take his own life and, and mercifully failed uh, to do so and was saved, I think, by the grace of God. And you'll hear that story in the doco. Um, a friend of mine have their daughter on suicide watch now. I'm I'm aware of of a number of people that have passed away from successful suicide attempts. I mean, this is there there is a lot of that going on right now. And anyone that says otherwise has their head in the sand. But let me let me tell you just how low these people have stooped. Daniel Andrews claimed that there was no evidence in a rise in suicides uh, because the statistics didn't show it. What he failed to mention is that the coroner takes a very long time to rule a death as a suicide. They first have to go through and rule out any other possibilities. It's kind of, it's the when it's the last one, last thing left standing, then they'll eventually rule it a suicide. So there's a considerable lag there. Uh, and that's why it wasn't until this year that the statistics actually started to come out showing that there was a spike in suicides last year, is because of that lag, because of that time. Instead of Daniel Andrews being honest and saying, yes, we're, we're, we're hearing a lot of concern from uh, from the coroner, we're hearing a lot of concern from funeral parlors from with what they're seeing, we're hearing a lot of concern from mental health uh, services from what they're seeing. Instead, he went to the one statistic that he knew would lag, that he knew would not yet have started to show the, the truth of what was happening. That is how cynical these people are. Anything for a political point. Oh, and he'll be looking for the slightest trace through a PCR test of the slightest trace of COVID to say that the person who drove his car into a tree or hung himself in his garage yeah. died of COVID. And and I, I wish that that was a joke, but that's that's actually happening. It's happening all over the world, and it's, it's happening in Australia. It is. It's, it is. It's such a such a, a joke. The, the the statistics unscrambling the egg of the bad statistics is going to take a very long time. Uh, for people to actually begin to learn and figure out how many people really did die of COVID and how many people simply had it in their system or how many people maybe didn't even have it in their system. It was a false positive and so it's, forth. It's going to take more than a long time. It's going to take a Royal Commission. That's what it's going right. to take. At, at, the, at the very least. So you're now, you've decided to start doing some some remarkable things. You've, you've created an organization. I'm very ignorant about what that is and what you're up to. So could you, for the sake of me and everyone else who might be meeting you for excuse me, for the first time or not be aware of what you're doing. Tell me a little bit about what Graham Hood is doing now to continue this fight. Well, Graham Hood is actually just a mouthpiece. Um, okay. Um, what happened was uh, you're talking about Hoodie's helpers. Um, yep. So perplexed was I at the number of uh, people uh, threatening suicide unless something happened. I couldn't cope with it. I was struggling to sleep. My wife's a psychologist, and we we've been running a ministry for fifteen years, uh, dealing with people uh, dealing with recovery, restoring broken lives, mm -hmm. uh, the victims of childhood sexual abuse, men with porn addictions, yeah. suicidal men, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I've got a suicide watch in my phone. There are a certain a number of men that I talk to regularly. If they ever ring me, this is before mm -hmm. COVID. I always take the call. Um, I've had one guy lost to me who I was an accountability partner for several years ago, who took his own life. I knew he was going to do it and there was nothing I could do to stop him. And I vowed and declared I'd never let that happen, let that happen on my watch ever again. Um, so when I saw all these people reaching out, and most of them from Victoria, I was so perplexed. I thought there's got to be, I need help from people. I need, I need a network of people who I can refer to. And there was one lovely lady counsellor, Lynn, who... Um, who has, has got 30 years' experience in crisis counselling. Absolute angel. Can I, can, I just, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second, Jace? I'm so sorry. Just read Jace's comment there. Um, I'm so sorry, mate. There's uh, there's nothing else that can be said with that. Um, just if you, uh, yeah, if you need help, reach out, mate. You can reach out to my page or uh, or you can have a listen to what um, what Graham's saying here and reach out to them if you need uh, need some support dealing with that. Sorry, Graham. I hope my friend who says the suicide rates are down is watching this. Yeah. Jace, I'm really I'm really sorry about that, buddy. Um anyhow, I Hoodie's help us is there for you, um, Jace as well. I, I reached out with a video clip to anybody. Um, who could um, who could help? And this lovely lady, Lynn, um, she was already starting to do some work for me. I was I was reflecting people onto her, deflecting them onto her, and she was she's run a little uh, Telegram group that's helping them. 
I'm reading the next one. Yeah, well, this one's from Beck. My nine-year-old girl was talking about suicide during last year's lockdown. The wait list for her age group for counselling was 18 months long. Thankfully, we caught COVID, which makes us eligible sooner. That is a sentence that just shouldn't exist. That arrangement of words in the English language should never have been possible. What an insane world we live in. Beck, again, if you need anything, reach out to me, reach out to Hoodie's Helpers. Um, you know, this is this is literally why Graham's doing what he's doing. Um, a lot of people, I, I began to talk about suicide when I was working with farmers on the water issues, which have not gone away, and I look forward to getting back to that and fighting for them uh, in, the, in water issues in the Murray-Darling Basin. But there has been a significant increase in suicides amongst farmers as a result of water prices and water availability. And um, I began to speak about suicide then. And of course, I had the usual suspects come out saying, oh, it's irresponsible to talk about suicide. You shouldn't do it. It can, it can create ideation for, for people that are you know, on, the, on the, the borderline, et cetera. And I cannot disagree more. I cannot disagree more with that view. When we isolate people feeling ashamed about what's going on inside their heads and feeling like they can't reach out and talk, that it's a taboo subject, that they should be somehow ashamed um, of, of what's going on inside their own head, I, I think we make the problem worse. So uh, for those that, that find this a touchy subject, I'm sorry, but I, I, it needs to be discussed. We can't, we can't just sweep this stuff under the carpet and pretend it's not happening. It really does. You know what, Tafer, if we don't speak about it, they're going to be screens full of these messages for years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the lady I've been deflecting people to initially was a la lovely lady called Lynn and she was doing some great work. And then somebody um, energised by everything that's going on, a wonderful lady, uh, Diana. Um, I, I haven't got permission to use her last, last... Yes, I can. Diana Maitland. She's she's running this, this show for us. She's sitting on a leaky old yacht that her friend gave her to live on because she had nowhere to live. She's a registered nurse, high experience, a lovely Scottish lass. She's an absolute gem. Um, she decided to design a page off of Facebook called Hoodies Helpers, and she put it up within an hour of me, um, an hour of me saying I needed help. And she asked for volunteers to run a crisis line. And she got flooded with mental health mm. professionals and doctors and nurses and psychologists and counsellors and people mm. who work for Lifeline. Uh, who were who were um, no longer allowed to work for Lifeline, and, and that grew. It went absolutely nuts. So that's her baby. She set it up. She surrounded herself with amazing people in the tech field that were setting up websites and designing phone lines and logos, yeah. and there were people organising, massive organising. We've had thousands of responses from people who, A, want help and people who, B, want to give help. And the yeah. beauty of it is... It provided a, a forum for people who are destitute because they're no longer allowed to serve the community that they devoted their lives and careers to in health mm -hmm. who want to still serve even though they can't earn a living from it. So it gives them an impetus to wake up in the morning yeah, and it allows them to apply their skills, their beautiful skills, to people who desperately need it. So it was a two-pronged thing and it just had to work. And so then we started talking with Diana and saying, look, we could offer a whole lot of other services. Like for a start, people, most people just need to talk about this, right? They, they, they don't need necessarily professional counselling. They just need someone to facilitate a little group where they can talk about how bad they feel when they wake up in the morning. And, yeah. and then if anyone's in crisis, they can be steered to a professional who's got yeah. all the indemnity in place and all that sort of stuff sure. that can look after them, right? So we're a referral service more than a, a counselling service. And then I suggested uh, one idea that came to my head. There's a lot of unemployed teachers out there who are going to be wanting to keep teaching. So then the idea has come up to run Zoom classes for parents who are homeschooling their kids so that they, yep. teachers can come on board and help. And some yep. teachers may charge a small fee for that, but they, they've got to put bread on their table. Mm -hmm. And then there's paramedics and, and uh, doctors and nurses who have got so many services they can offer. Um, we've linked up with a bunch of food banks. We've got we're collecting data on businesses that are saying this this um, this um, this mandate is bull. We're going to allow people into our stores. There are people who are saying that we're going to offer jobs to people who haven't been vaccinated. Um, it's just this incredible network. Now that the Telegram page is filled with people. Uh, a lady the other day, for example, she said she's got a young girl who's. Um, who's uh, suffering, I think it's from, 
No, she's got a she's got an incredibly I can't think of the name of it. Anyhow, it's, she's got an incredibly bad um, um, a disability, and she has to travel seven hours to Brisbane once a month with her daughter to have a treatment that lasts all day. Then they stay at Ronald McDonald House, and then they drive mm. the seven hours back. Mm. Ronald McDonald House sent her a letter saying that they are no longer allowed to offer those services to anybody who hasn't been jabbed. And lo and behold, this woman said, I don't know what to do. My daughter needs this help. Now, within five minutes, somebody had come straight online and offered her accommodation whenever she has to do that. Beautiful. So, I mean, we're seeing this. We're seeing people jumping all over other people to support them. And it's yeah. a wonderful initiative that Diana set up. You know, the only credit, credit I can claim is that that my name's attached to it and I made the plea and I'm going to continue to support it with my name. And and to me, it's a mechanism to rebuild the spirit of Australia, which we've lost. Yeah. And my wife is, is heavily involved in it too because she's one of the New South Wales coordinators and she's a psychologist and she's trying desperately to pull it all together and, and plus do all the work that I'm not doing on the farm um, because I spend yeah. all my time looking at this screen. And um, yeah. So I'm surrounded by incredible people who want to make a difference. And if all I am is a catalyst for that, and all I've got to do is open my big mouth and say a few of the, few things with humility, <laughs> and that's my job, I got the lucky end of the deal, you yeah. know, at the end of the yeah. day, Tafer. So it's, it's uh, www.hoodieshelpers, H-O-O-D-Y-S, not I-E-S, hoodieshelpers.com.au. Now the the website opened with a with a crisis line number on it the other day, and within an hour or two it collapsed because the weight of the weight of interest in it just went crazy. It's being monitored all over the world, incredibly, even in China. I wonder why. Does <laughs> anybody in China need hoodies helpers? Mm. Anyway, um, so um, there's interest in America. There's chapters starting up in uh, in New Zealand. There are chapters starting up all over the state. Small communities. Each state has a chapter, mm. uh, and they're still all coordinating with one another. And look, Tracy there says, "Love this community." I think Tracy's probably involved in it, um, mm. as a lot of people will be watching. Are we're building a new tribe? And one woman said to me, and it was amazing. She said, "I've lost my family because of my decisions, but I found my tribe." Yeah. And you know what? If we're yeah. going to live in segregated apartheid Australia, we're going to show them how we're going to do it. We're not mm -hmm. going to like it. We're not going to roll up and and uh, curl up into a ball. We're going to support the living daylights out of each other. Hundred percent. It's what oh. Aussies have done since we came here, and it's what the Aborigines did before we came here. The original inhabitants of Australia, who mm -hmm. had this country humming like a top, mm -hmm. humming like a bird, and and we've come in and turned it into a penal colony and made them our prime guests, if you like. Um, we've got so much to learn from them, but that's another part mm. of the story. But mm. uh, at the end of the day, this community is a tribe. We're a mob. No, we're not yeah. a tribe. We're a mob. Yeah. And we're going to show, we're going to show the rest of Australia who's poo hooing us that we're not going to take this line down. We're not going quietly into the night, and we're going to support the living daylights out of each other, and we're oh. going to support the living daylights out of the people who have been double jabbed as well, because we have to be the change yeah. we want to see. And yeah. So we're not. We know there are a lot of people who have been coerced into being jabbed who are still doing it really tough, even though mm -hmm. they were promised that life would be good again. They're struggling and um, and we're there for them too. They need support. And it's not about your medical choice. It doesn't matter what you choose. It's your right to choose. You have to be your voice for choice. And if you're not, mm -hmm. then Ofer and I will be your voice for choice. Yeah. There's an interesting little microcosm going on in the comments here. This, this happens from time to time. Um, where some people take exception to the fact that I am consuming alcohol and enjoying uh, some entirely natural uh, products in uh, in the comfort of my own home whilst on a, a chat with someone. Listen, number one, we can't sit here and say that we, we support choice and then be selective about the choices that we support. This is one of the uncomfortable things about believing in freedom is that it actually requires you to believe that people are free to make bad choices so long as they're not hurting other people. Okay. Now this is bad for me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend it's not, this is bad for me, but it's actually very good for my mental health. And so much so that a, a my now business partner and I actually started a subscription service for cigars in the first part of COVID in 2020, because we knew so many blokes who were doing it so tough. And what we do is we get together on a Friday night, every single week. And we, we smoke, we all have the same cigar. 
we smoke it together and we talk online, we talk about the cigars and where they come from and flavor notes and all that sort of stuff. And that little community, it's only very, very small, right? The cigars are not a big thing in Australia at all. There's a very, very small number of people. But the responses that we've had and the feedback that we've had from the people in that group, in the case of one individual, is that we've been a literal lifesaver in his case because we've given him that one thing in his week, every week that he knows is gonna be there for him and he can look forward to and spend some time with some good blokes enjoying a guilty pleasure. And that is what's keeping him going right now. For me, I know that when the weight of the world gets me down and, and can I take, do a sidebar here, Graham, I've had a little insight into your page in the last couple of hours because uh, we linked me up as an admin of your page in order to be able to broadcast this on your page tonight. I thought I got a lot of messages, and I do. I get a lot of messages and emails. Graham's page is on a whole other level. The amount of messages you get, mate, is phenomenal. That is a full-time job by itself, and I tip my hat to you that you can keep up with that in any way, shape, or form. I, I can't. I can't yeah. take it. Now. Uh, People yeah. are saying to me, you know, do you realize you've got all these me What? And I say, what does that mean? Uh, yeah. I don't, I've got no way, because I'm a, I'm a technical dunce when it comes to social media, but... But, um, yeah, I can't, and I have to apologise every opportunity I can. There are so many people I want to reach out to. Man, I'd love I'd love to give them all a hug. I'm a bit of a huggy, mm -hmm. touchy, mm -hmm. kind of guy. But as for you, you know, I've been really concerned watching you indulge your pleasures tonight. I really have because um, there was one stage where the end fell off your cigar into your crutch, and I thought you'd set your crutch on fire. <laughs> and, and I thought that was a hazard. Um, and I also pity whoever's living in behind the door that you're smoking this thing from because of the fumes that are going underneath it. Mm -hmm. um, but for goodness sake, you know, let's let's stop judging each other. You know, there are yeah. fine things in life. The fine things I enjoy in life are uh, uh, not to hurt anybody else's taste. But you know what? This is all about your right to put into your body whatever it is you want. You have body autonomy. And yeah. you are, by your own admission, in your way, supporting your mental health, yeah, and um, and so yeah, for me, uh, more power to you. You know, I when I became a Christian, I became a Seventh Day Adventist Christian, yeah, um, and um, I had to give up things like uh, coffee and prawns and oysters, all the things I loved. I didn't have to give them up. It took me a while, yeah, but I did because I realised that they they weren't as good for my body, and I wanted to do the right thing and treat my body as a temple and all that sort of stuff. But um, at the end of the day, I don't miss it now, but there are times when I'd really love to sit down to a kilo of prawns and a icy cold, um, <laughs> an icy cold Corona, I've got to tell you, uh, especially when I've been out the farm all day. But um, oh, you know, uh, look, uh, Katerina, God bless you. Um, we're all God's children. And I've got to sign up my driveway that says no judgment beyond this point. Yeah, and it's nice. been in that driveway for 15 years. We had it carved in wood. Nice. And so when people come to visit us for, for counselling or, or any kind of restoration, um, they turn up and uh, they see that sign and we say we really stand by it. But I've got to tell you, um, listen, reading the Bible and listening to music, God bless you, Carmel. Uh, I've got to tell you that, um, that that sign irritates the daylights out of me because every time I drive up my driveway and read it, I realised how I haven't been living into it because I've been condemning and judging people and, you know, on the road and, mm. and all that sort of stuff. All these things are designed to help us develop our, our character. And, um, and you know, so we all have different ways of approaching it. Yeah. Um, I'm addicted to fishing. I'm addicted to a whole lot of stuff. Um, I'm glad I'm not addicted to porn anymore. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, so we're, we're all broken. Tafel, we're all broken. We're all busted. We've just got to own our dirt. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like... Yeah, I, I tell people about. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I just don't stick my arm in the toilet. Sometimes I, do, <laughs> you know, I wear my heart on my sleeve because it's the safest way to be. My, my strength lies in my vulnerability, and yeah. um, I learned that in a new age program I did with some dear friends in Victoria many years ago called Stepping yeah. Out. It was amazing, and it's true. Your strength lies in your vulnerability. Nobody. You know, I'm in the public eye well and truly now. People can come out of the woodwork and say, oh, you know, he he. I saw him going into a brothel in Melbourne, you know, 25 years sure. ago, 20 years ago. And I'd say, yeah, yeah I did. But everyone knows yeah. about it. Yeah. I, you know, I don't have to hide it. Big deal, you know. Yeah. What have you yeah. been hiding? Yeah, yeah. We have Look, you mentioned. Here. Yeah, Deborah. You, on you, you mentioned fishing. And I want to side by here. We, we touched on mental health earlier, and I want to sort of talk specifically about men's mental health. 
one of the really interesting things that that uh, you know has been said to me, and I, it makes sense, and I think it's true about the way the male brain works, mm-hmm. is we need to talk just like anybody does, and and it really helps to lift burdens and so forth. But mm-hmm. we're we're very uncomfortable catching up for a chat. We don't blokes don't really do that. We don't catch up for a chat. That, mm, you know, that's that. Oh, hang on. Culturally, we're kind of that's not what we do, right? Yep. But we'll go to the pub, and because we went to the pub, we didn't catch up for a chat. We went to the pub, and that's okay. We're allowed to do that. You're allowed to go down to the pub with your mates. While we're at the pub, we chat. You're allowed to go fishing with your mates, and while you're fishing, you chat if you're with mates. You're allowed to smoke cigars, thankfully, still. They're probably going to get outlawed sometime soon. I tell you, the best conversations that I have, and one of the reasons why I enjoy these while I'm chatting with amazing people like you, is because there's something about the effect that tobacco has on my brain and the legitimizing effect of this in terms of it's okay to get together with your mates to have a cigar. I have the best conversations over a cigar. The best conversations that I have ever had have been with one of these in my hand, sitting face to face with a mate who's also got one of these in my hand. And somehow you just bypass all the superficial crap and you just start talking about stuff that matters in a way that, I don't know, is hard to do a lot of the time. So this external activity, this other excuse, this other reason why we're together, fishing, going to the pub, going to the footy, you know, having a cigar, then legitimizes the, the, the conversations that we have. And it's just so important for, for mental health. And I think it's particularly important for men where we just don't feel like we're allowed to ring somebody up and say, hey, I'm just ringing for a chat. We don't, for some reason, that doesn't feel okay to us. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I read some stats not long ago. Oh, it's a while ago now. It's about 10 years ago. That um, about every two and a half hours, a male in Australia will take his own life. Mm. Um, some of those are uh, where they leave a note and the other one will appear in the news. You know, a man was driving to work this morning and police can't explain why he hit that tree on the side of a straight road. Yeah, I was going to do that once back in in uh, in probably uh, early 1990s. I was going to do that. I used to live at uh, Macedon and I was driving into oh, yeah. uh, Melbourne Airport and there was a I had a V8 Fairlane and there was a tree on the side of the road that used to get covered in black frost early in the morning that I'd picked out. Um, uh, thank God I'm past that. Um, but um, uh, I also read in the same stats that seven times more women than men talk about taking their own lives. Yeah. But four times more men than women actually do it. Now, women yeah. like to talk about their issues. They like to yeah. share with one another. They, they, uh, they're very outward in talking about this stuff. And, uh, and men don't do that. You know, we bottle things up. Why? Because we live in this competitive environment. You know, the male yeah. sperm cell is always the first to the egg. It races. Yeah. And when it gets there, it's so exhausted it dies. There are more cot deaths that are male than female. The, the male is inherently uh, genetically and physically quite weak, um, the male of the species. So yeah. uh, we struggle. And we live in a very competitive environment. And... Um, and the other big thing is we haven't been mentored. Um, yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to. We haven't been mentored. And, um, you know, I've often said I came up with the phrase when I started working with men years ago uh, in, in these issues that if the recipe for a good man required the ingredients to be taken out of the oven in an hour and a half, most men have been taken out in about an hour. Yeah. So we look down on the outside, but when you carve us up, we collapse. There's nothing yeah. in us. Yeah, and I had I had a massive log in my backyard on the Gold Coast, and we lived on acreage there, where we ran our ministry when we first started, and there was this massive cedar log. It was massive, and I had it across the back of my my garden. And when I'd be talking to men, I'd take them down to sit on the log, and mm. uh, we'd sit there, and I'd tap this beautiful big piece of cedar, and I'd say, "Isn't this amazing? Imagine how big this tree was." And they'd say, yeah, it's huge, isn't it? I say, how much do you reckon this log weighs? And, you know, some guys, oh, there might be three or four tonne in this easily. And I'd mm. say, you'd reckon, wouldn't you? I said, stand up and have a look at the end of it. And it was a pipe. Yeah. It was that all the way around. Yeah. And I say to them, and they say, wow, you could have fooled me. It just looked like mm. a solid log. And I'd, mm. they'd sit down and I'd say, that log, yeah, that's how you feel, isn't it? Hmm. That's how you feel. You mm. know what? You know what, Topher? Trees are amazing things. And and that log, that tree would have been a beautiful, healthy specimen. 
but when we look at the, the the growth rings of a tree the smallest circle in the middle is the sapling when that tree first sprung out of the ground right and it's grown year by year there's been another growth ring added to it the decay normally starts in the middle the child yeah. tree the yeah. baby tree when that's damaged and it fails it leaves decay an area for decay to creep in and destroy the adult tree yeah and that is a metaphor for what i see happening in men you know you can look at a massive spotted gum tree and you think wow look at that yeah and you'll have a thunderstorm and five minutes later you'll hear this crash and it's come down to the ground it looks strong and um and nothing uh there yeah, was nothing no substance, it. And no substance yeah. and it collapsed yeah. and our men today are suffering from fatherlessness uh the prisons are full of men and women who have had no father uh, mongrel fathers or um, mm -hmm. absent fathers or you know guys that were too busy doing their own thing to raise their kids because their fathers were that way too and so for me we need to address that we need to mentor our young men into manhood we need to take them from initiation through initiation and take them from boyhood psychology to manhood psychology mm -hmm. across the line i i um I, uh, I witnessed a, a Thursday Islander initiation when I lived in Cairns. My next door neighbour was a wonderful um, uh, Thursday Island family. And uh, they lived in a tiny little 10 square, a three bedroom house that had a combined family kitchen living area, a very small fibro place. Yeah. And I heard a lot of commotion over the back fence. And I leaned over and I said, Joe, what are, what's going on here? And he said, Oh, we're, we're building a, a fire pit. We're going to have a, a hungy. And I said, what's that in aid of? He said, oh, my, my son Joe, my son Joe Jr. is being initiated tonight. And I said, what's yeah. all that about? And he said, he said, oh, would you like to come and watch? And I said, I'd love to, you know. So um, we got time, haven't we, for me to tell this story? We, we have we have all the time in the world, mate. That's The, the oh, word no. slow is in this, it's called a slow chat for a very good reason. Just so you know, my record with um, Senator, uh, his name escapes me, we went till no, just after no. midnight. And I know Malcolm Roberts was like three and a half hours. Um, I did three with Malcolm Roberts the other day. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah, he's he's fantastic to talk to. So listen, four hours is the record. I'm not competitive. I don't feel the need to break the record. But for as long sure. as we've got stuff to talk about, let's just talk. People can people right. can go to bed when they're ready. Yeah, and they can wake up in the morning and we'll still be there. You'll have to. Crack <laughs> um, so um, I went along to this to this um, this celebration and. I walked into the front door of the house. And the front door opened straight into the lounge room. There was no little hall, hallway, and it's just very small. And Mary, uh, little Joe's mother, was standing at one end of the of the house. Uh, all the furniture had been shifted out of the house, except for uh, a chair and a small coffee table with a towel over some stuff on the coffee table uh, in the middle of the room. All the men were at one end of the room. All the women were at the other end of the room. And I walked in and I stood in the middle at the back wall just to observe what was going on. Mm. And Mary, the, the Thursday Islander mum, she was a massive rotund lady, lady, a lovely Islander lady, just gorgeous. And um, she was standing with her arms out like this. And behind her was Joe Jr. Now, Joe Jr. was about six foot tall. He was about 14 years of age. Yeah. And Joe yeah. Sr., his father, was a little fella, a little Islander guy. And he had all the men behind him. Now, when everything had settled down, Joe, the father, called out to Mary, the mother. Mother, mm -hmm. let the boy go. And she had her hands back like this, protecting the boy and says, no, no, you can't have him. Yeah. And he says, mother, let the boy go. No, no, you can't have him. Mother, let the boy go. And the men started chanting, mother, let the boy go. Mother, let the boy go. And the women are chanting, no, no, you can't have him. And the din was incredible. And behind the big woman was this young boy, and he was crying. He was so emotional. And in the end, the din died down, and Joe walked up to his wife, and he put his hand on her shoulder, and he looked at her with the utmost of love, and he said to her, Mother, you've done a wonderful job raising our son, but it's time for me and the men to take over now. Please let the boy go. And they hugged, and then she turned around, and she was tied with a length of wool from her wrist to her son's wrist. And she got a pair of gold scissors and she cut the cord. And she said, raising you has been the greatest pleasure of my life, Joe, but it's time for you to go to your father and the men. 
And with that, he crossed the room and all the men embraced him and all the women cried and they comforted Mary. And then they sat the boy down in the chair. They pulled the white towel off the table and underneath the white towel was a bunch of shaving accoutrements and all the men took turns at shaving him. And when it was over, they took him out the back to the fire pit and there were sea turtles, dugong, red deer, all the traditional yeah. First Island affair, painted yeah. crows, just beautiful, sop, sop. And the men partied for three days. And those men talked to little Joe about having sex, about raising children, about getting a job, about building a house, about hunting mm -hmm. dugong. And if mm -hmm. anything ever happened to his father, he knew that there were another 30 men in that tribe that were mm -hmm. going to fill the gap. Now, I lived next door to that young man, and I saw him change overnight. He became mm -hmm. a man through that initiation. And we don't do that for our kids in Western society. No. Our original people do, and or they used to. They don't do it much anymore. But we have to take boys on a journey. We have to give them everything we can to validate them. We have to tell them that it's vitally important that they've been given everything we have to give them. And then mm. we tick the box saying, I've given you everything I can to make you the best man you can be. The rest is up to you. Here's your mm. license. And then we take them into manhood, equipped to deal with it. And men like that are strong without being alpha. The real mm. measure of a man is not how often he draws his sword, but how often he chooses not to. Yeah. Real men like that create a society where it's safe for women and children to flourish, not to be controlled and manipulated. And domestic violence doesn't come from a man who's been validated. And the reason we're seeing so much of this is we're overgoverned, we're mm. under mentored, and we're not given the proper mentoring and the proper leadership by the old fogies, guys like us, who have to bring the boys through that stage and give them something to aim for that's decent. Because inside every young boy and every man, there's a hero waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. And I ask questions of men. I say to men a couple of things. Would you like your daughter to marry a man like you? Mm. And a lot of guys say no. Mm. And I say, well, I don't want to know the reason, but I want you to examine the reason. Whatever that is, that's God shining a light on a defect in your character that you need to rectify. Mm. Now, I wouldn't have wanted my daughters to marry a man like me when I was like I was when mm. I was raised because I was a, 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 I had a sex addiction. Mm. I was unfaithful to their mother and I had a porn addiction. I look back on my life then with disgust, mm. but not anymore. I see those things that I went through as much as they cost my family. I see what those things that I went through as, as a measure of who I am today, that I wouldn't have had the, the wherewithal to go forward to seek a better life and to improve my character if I hadn't been through that. So, you know, there, there's, there's God never wastes a hurt. But when we realise that, and the other question I ask is, what would you like your kids to say about you at your funeral? Yeah. And most guys get really upset. And I, said to, I said to a guy once, you know, he was behaving really badly in the couple that we were counselling. And I said to him, I asked him what the worst thing he'd ever done to his wife was. And when he told mm. us, there were four of us there, him and his wife and Michelle and I, when, when, he, um, when he told us what he'd done, it was sickening. And I, I just said to him, you're a dog. Now, mm. this, guy had a, this guy was in his mid-50s. He had a beard. He'd always had a beard all, his, all of his adult life. He was a, a narcissistic control freak. And she was manipulated into a little hulking poor thing who was too afraid to speak. You know, he always answered every question for her. And um, and I said to him, when he said that, I said, you're just a dog. And he got up to have a go at me. And I said, mm -hmm. look, hang on, before you before you get your ants in, in a pants, your pants, ants in your pants, you need to sit down and hear what I've got to say. Mm -hmm. I know you're a dog because I used to be a dog, but I was never that bad. And here's the other thing you know that I know. You know that you're a dog and you don't like it. Mm -hmm. Any man who abuses his children and his wife in domestic violence doesn't like his behaviour. No. He doesn't like it, but he's addicted yeah. to it. And so, and I said to him, if you died today and your funeral was next week, this is what your funeral would look like. There'd be half a dozen women surrounding your wife, hugging her, saying, um, you know what, uh, you, you can rest him, you can be happy now, he's gone, he's not around to infect you anymore. Um there'd be a, a, a pastor in the church saying stuff about you that were lies because he didn't know you. 
Yeah. There would be there would be um your sons would be at the pub getting drunk celebrating the fact that you're no longer around to infect their lives. And there'd be half a dozen men in yellow reflective shirts from the factory you worked in who'd be just sitting there saying, Oh, you know, you're just um uh, he's the guy we used to have lunch with, so it was lunch hour, so we thought we'd come and see him off. Yeah. But if you get it right this weekend and you die in three years' time, the church will be packed with people who admired you. Mm -hmm. Your wife would be grieving the fact that she finally got the husband she always wanted and now he's gone. And your sons would stand in suits at the pulpit and say what a what an incredible man you were in a glowing eulogy because you admitted to your problems and yeah. you sorted it out and you became a mentor for them. And he just sat there dumbfounded. And I said to him, which funeral do you want? And he said, I want the second one. And I said, well, what are you going to do to get it? Mm -hmm. And I do, I do a series for men called Living for a Good Funeral. Yeah, wow. Okay. Live your life so that you have a good, meaningful funeral. And it doesn't involve how much money you've got or how many houses or boats or cars you own. It's about your relationships and yeah. how you've lived your life and how you've grown through the darkness of your life. My darkness came from growing up in dysfunction. And my father's and mother's darkness came from growing up in dysfunction. We have to accept that we come out of dysfunction but we have to break the chain. There are areas of our lives where we need to break the chain. And that's what I'm about. That's what I try to get men to do. And so yeah. at the end of the day, this guy, that that night, he was just dumbfounded. And they went to stay in a little guest shack that we had out the back. And the next morning they walked in and they were coming in for breakfast and they were loving. And he was clean shaven and they looked different. He had no beard. Mm. And we said, what's happened with you two? Michelle said, what happened? She said, I woke up this morning at 6 o'clock and he was kneeling beside the bed and he had no beard. And she said, I've never seen him in 34 years without a beard. And I said to him, what happened? And he said, I got up at half past two this morning and shaved my beard off. She said, why did you do that? He said, I don't ever want you to wake up and see that face ever again. Wow. That's the journey we have to go on. Now, here's the thing. When I then that day, I took that guy back on a journey through his past, and it all stemmed from his father, mm. who used to beat the daylights out of him with a belt and silk so he could see stars for no reason. He would belt him up every day as a kid. And I said to him, What about your father? He said, Don't you talk to me about my father? I hate his guts. Yeah. And I said, Well, what do you know about your father? And he said, well, he was, you know, he went to the Korean War and he saw a lot of bad stuff in the Korean War. And I said, mm. uh, I said, um, what what did your father see? And, oh, I don't know. Mum said he was the life of the party before the Korean War, but he came back broken. Mm. And I said, what, what happened? Well, you know, a couple of guys in his unit uh, froze to death in the trench and he wow. saw a couple of other guys get their heads blown off in a mortar barrage. And I said, oh, he said, yeah, it would have been gross. So I said, how do you reckon you'd have gone living your father's life? And he thought about it. And he said, what do you mean? I said, imagine you being in that situation. How would you feel? He said, good grief. He said, I'd have probably done a worse job of my life than he did of his. Yeah. And I said, so do we need to forgive your dad? And he got to the point where he said, actually, I think my dad did the best he could. Maybe there's nothing mm. to fear. And when we realise that, Topher, when we realise that the people who've hurt us were acting out of through the knothole of their own pain, we get a glimpse of what true grace and forgiveness is all about. And they no longer have their pain no longer controls us because we forgive them and we get control of our life back. And I, I saw that when my wife Michelle forgave the man who perpetrated the worst possible sexual violence against her as a child every weekend for six years, a church mm. elder. We tracked mm. him down, she forgave him, and when she forgave him, she took control of her life back. Yeah, she wow. said to the guy, I've come all the way across Australia to tell you that I forgive you. And it was a moving moment. And he, um, he actually touched her on the back of the hand and stroked her hand like that and smiled and he teared up and he said, Thank you, Shelley. And I want you to know that I forgive you too because you know you were just as responsible as I was. Mm. And I was enraged and I grabbed him by the shoulder and I nearly crushed his shoulder and I drew back a fist. And Michelle said, no, 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 no. 
please, please um, don't do this. Don't do this. And she looked at the sky and she said, God, give me strength. Mm. And then she looked him straight in the eye and she said, despite everything you just said, I still forgive you. And at that moment, I saw his whole demeanour change. It was like a dark shadow exited his body and took off like a scolded cat. And I came up with a saying that day. And the saying is that grace and evil cannot share the same house and evil is always the first to leave. Yeah, wow. Evil, is always, evil cannot stand against grace. And she demonstrated that. And he lost more than if he'd gone to prison. He lost because... He lost her control, lost control of her, and she got yeah. it back. And her life has never looked back ever since. Um, I've seen this firsthand. I've seen absolute miracles at the hand of hand of Jesus Christ, mm. and that's why I've, that's why I switched from being an atheist to a devout follower of, of Jesus Christ. And I mm. make no apologies for it. I have seen yeah. miracles wrought in the name of grace, and and um, I'll defend that to the day I die. I stand on the rock that held the cross, that held the Son of Man, who mm. died 2,000 years ago so a filthy porn addict like me would have a second chance. And yeah. that's where I stand and I make no apologies for it and I don't have to Bible back to anybody. My life is a living example of the grace of Jesus Christ. Mate, uh, what, do, what do I even say? Like, I just need to turn my microphone off and and let graham keep going for the next couple of hours you you have ministered to me and i know from the comments you've ministered to a lot of people with those stories that you just shared with us um just that the total honesty that you bring there's no ego there's no pretension and that is such a rare thing graham so thank you thank you from the bottom of my heart there are there are a lot of people in need of conversations like this and there's a lot of people you know um, let, let me share someone in a, in a very different scenario that I've been talking with recently. He's a young man, uh, not yet 30, and um, he shared with me that he wanted to uh, attract the attention of a young lady. And I've only gotten to know him relatively recently, but he's, he's one of these people who's an absolute heart of gold, but he's still a child. He never had that initiation that you spoke about graham he never had that moment and he unsurprisingly has a very strained relationship with both of his parents his, his dad especially um and has not had a good example set for him through his life and i was on the phone to him and i i'm a christian as well for those that don't know i don't shove it down people's throats so that might be news to some people but i i am as well and i just felt prompted and i i shared with him the verse in scripture when i was a child i spoke as a child and i understood as a child and I, something else as a child, I lived as a child, basically. But when That's I became crazy. a man, yeah. yeah, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, listen, you need to spend less time thinking about who the woman, who, who's the perfect woman for you, and more time thinking about being the kind of man that your ideal woman would actually want to marry. Yep. And with that simple conversation, this was only about two weeks ago, he has already started to make some very significant changes in his life, selling off a bunch of things that are holding him back, focusing a lot more on the things that can actually carry him forward. And what I realized, I mean, who am I? I'm, I'm a 30-year-old, 39-year-old man with my own messed up history and all kinds of mistakes that I've made and, and things that I've needed to ask forgiveness for. Um, but, but in that small way and in that small conversation, you know, that, that little conversation was more mentoring for this young man than he'd had in just about the rest of his life combined. There is a massive hole in our society right now. There is a massive gap in how we're raising our kids. And I look, I can't speak for women because I'm, I'm not one, but I can certainly say for men, there is a massive, massive gap. We are not raising boys to be men. Now, I, I applaud what you're doing, Graham, but how do we fix the bigger problem? I mean, I mean, Hoodie's Heroes, is helping people and doing amazing work. You're doing amazing work. But how do we, instead of fixing the symptoms and, and the broken people, how do we, how do we help fathers to, to not raise broken children? How do, we, how do we stop it before it starts? Well, you know, the, the, the fathers who are raising broken children are broken children still themselves. So we don't, sure. we don't fix it by not having the conversation. So just what we're doing now is planting a seed for some of the people who are watching us speak whether they be men or women, uh, you know, we model, for example, if you're at home and you're a married couple raising kids, 
you need to know that we model marriage to our children. So what they're seeing in your behaviours as a couple mm. is going to be reflected in what they look for when they get older. And it's a pretty simple process. Yet, oh, excuse me, that that uh, that beautiful vintage water I've been drinking. Um, <laughs> the, other, the other side of that coin is that um, the greatest gift we can give our children is a happy marriage. Yeah. Um, you can give them all the trappings of a, of a, of a, of a, you know, a, a good, healthy living and, a, and um, you know, all the bits and pieces that they want, but you've got to give them what they need. The average Australian father spends 37 seconds a day in one-on-one -on -one communication with each of his children. And that was yeah. Bureau of Statistics 2006. Wow. Now that, what that means, Topher, is that by the time your son is six years old, the television will have spent more time talking to him than you will in his entire mm. lifetime, mm. in his entire lifetime. So how can he grow to be a man? Yeah. How can he? And so we need to prioritise. I've, I've said to guys, uh, guys I fly with, I used to fly with, you know, wonderful guys. And if I've never flown with a guy before, I've always been interested in who I'm flying with, you know. And I'd mm. say I'd say things like, um, you know, uh, Hey, what do you, you know, when we're in the cruise and the autopilot's on and we're sitting there waiting for lunch to come up, and I'd say to them, What do you do for fun? And one guy said to me, I don't have fun, I've got kids. Oh. And I said, What do you mean? He said, Well, I spend my whole life running them around, football, soccer, you know, swimming lessons, ballet lessons. I've got to work overtime to pay for the the public, the private school fees and the computers and the and the laptops and and uh and, you know, the missus wants to go to Europe for the holidays and all this sort of stuff. And and so he said, I'm putting my name down to work all the extra hours I can to pay the bills. And when I'm home, I don't have any time to do anything. And I said, why, why did you, why did, why did you do that? Why are you doing that? And he said, well, it's what's expected. Mm. I said, by whom? He said, well, that's what they expect. I said, who's they? He said, well, that's what's expected in society. I said, have you actually asked your children what they want from you? Yeah. He said, no. And I said, well, let me give you an example. If you were to go to your children now, and his kids are about eight or nine, eight mm. or nine, and if you had a box in each hand and inside the box on the right hand was the flash house with the swimming pool, the expensive private school education, every kid's got an iPhone and an iPad. We go to Disneyland for our holidays every year. Mm. And... And we've got BMWs in the in the carport, and Dad spends thirty seven seconds a day in one on one communication with his kids in that box. In the other box is we live in a modest home. We've got a couple of ten year old cars in the driveway. We go to a good public school. We go to Port Macquarie every year for our holidays on the beach, and Dad's in our life four hours every day. Which mm. one do you reckon your kids would want? Mm. And he said, probably the latter one. I said, yeah, yeah. Uh, they need you. <laughs> now, the trick, the trick with this, Tafer, is this. You've got to ask those questions before they get to puberty. Yeah. Because if you haven't done it before they get to puberty and you ask them that question, they're going to say, stuff you. You know, having yeah. you in our life 37 seconds a day is bad enough without you being in our life four hours a day. You're just a grunt. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take all the stuff that you work your guts out for and you just keep doing it. We don't want to know you. You've got to get this right early. Yeah. And we've got to do that in order to break the chain that our kids are going to be forced to drag for the rest of their lives and their kids and their kids and their kids. And we're going to have fatherless families. We're going to have mums raising the kids and dad's going to be off somewhere either doing his own thing or deserting the family. And our, our boys are never going to be men. They will never, ever get there. And so we really have to focus on this. And for me, if I've got, I don't know, I'm 69 in January, uh, however long I've got, if there's something I have to do, mm. uh, I've got to put bread on the table somehow. I really want to lead uh, a nationwide conversation around getting men back. Um, and I'd love to be able to sit down in one-on-one -on -one counselling with a whole bunch of men, but I need to do some media about it. I need to do some books about it. I need to yeah. do some public speaking about it. And I need to get on the forums like this where we can actually get this stuff happening because unless we do, the spirit of Australia will die. It'll die because yeah. the men have died. Um, their spirit has died. Yeah. And it's 
the, the reason most women say to me all the time is where have all the real men gone is because we're a whole bunch of boys walking around in man-sized bodies. Yeah. <laughs> And we haven't woken up to the fact yet. We've been feminised into oblivion. And the reason, you know, a lot of men saying, oh, it's a feminist movement. But the reason the feminist movement thrived is because the men were absent. Somebody had mm -hmm. to stand in the breach. Mm -hmm. And so the women women developed a movement to stand in the breach. Yeah. And, and we have to reclaim that, not in an aggressive way, but in a way that empowers women. Because for a real man who lives in honour, women and children are the heart of honour as it's yeah. said in that movie, Rob Roy, and we must yeah. nurture and protect it in them. Mm. And I think this is a really important point that you've just touched on and something that I think is culturally not well understood, so I'd love to get your thoughts on it. There is, of course, you know, the, we, we see various you know, men's rights movements and so forth, and I, I know people in those movements, and I know them to be decent but broken people doing yep. what they think is is the best thing, but I... I look at ultimately what many, by no means all, I don't want to paint with a too broad a brush and, and tar them all with the same brush, but within those movements, there are a significant number of, of people who mistake alphaism with being a real man. Their idea of masculinity is, is bombastic, testosterone-driven, dominant, intolerant. This is their idea of, of a man. And then, of course, the media gets a hold of that and says toxic masculinity or, or you know, Pop culture gets a hold of it, toxic masculinity. And and they're not wrong. So we've got this really confusing message now for, for, for a teenage boy who's trying to figure out what it is to be a man and hasn't had a good example. They've got the, the feminized version of manhood and then they've got this, this aggressive version of manhood and they're not seeing what's in between. Now, Graham, we've seen from you, even in just our, our chat so far, you're not afraid to wear your heart on your sleeve to no. show your emotions. To, to, to cry. You're in touch with your emotions. Those that have followed my work, you'll know that I'm I'm broadly speaking the same. There are things that have brought me to tears in the past. How do we reframe manhood in such a way that it's, it, it is that genuine manhood, that genuine standing in your own strength and having such strength that you don't need to bully other people. You don't need to be the alpha in the room. That's, that's actually weakness. How yeah. do we get that message through? We need to redefine hero. Um, we we hold up uh, gambling, womanising, uh, uh, grog swelling, fast bowlers as heroes. Yeah. In the country. yeah. We uh, we elevate um, rugby league players who win a grand final and at the grand final party break a glass and glass their girlfriend. Mm. Um, these are these are just boys living in man's bodies. Yeah. Um, the greatest compliment any woman ever paid me, other than my wife, Michelle, uh, was a woman in a church we attended, said, I love having you in the church because you're like the big sheepdog that sits on the hill and I feel safe <laughs> in the air. Now, yeah. that to me, That's beautiful. I felt so comfortable with that because, A, I'm a bit, I'm a bit on the bulky side and, B, I'm grey <laughs> like an old. We've got a marema who has got a hair colour like mine. Yeah. And, uh, and I love the fact I looked at I look at that dog and I see myself in him. We've got a beautiful Maremma, an Italian mountain sheepdog, and his whole life is just spent sitting on a hill, looking out and mm. making sure everybody's okay. And he yeah. goes a wolf, wolf every now and then a motorbike goes up the road. Yeah. Um, that that to me is real manhood. You know that's yeah. I'm I'm uh, look at the end of, at the in the autumn of my years. I'm really comfortable now with who I am, and. Um, and I think that shows in the people around me. They they feel comfortable around me. Well, they used to until I started ranting a bit lately. But um, <laughs> I, I I live I live in the fact that as as though I'm not pretty to look at, I actually look at myself in the mirror when I shave, and I don't want to vomit in the sink like I used to. And um, my motives for doing the things that I do in my life now are totally driven by service to others mm. and honouring God. Mm. And respecting other people's decisions and positions, which is why I stand for the the freedom of choice that we're fighting for at the moment. Yep. And living into that is really comfortable for me. Now I, I've stopped performing, Topher. We yeah. most men spend their whole lives performing to pretend that there's something they're not. I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. I've done all that. It wore me out. Um, <laughs> I've spent my whole life trying to impress people, and you know what? I've done. I've impressed more people since I got off the need to do it than I did when yeah. I was thriving on that. You know, if this, yeah. 
if this sort of following that I've got now had happened to me 20 years ago, my ego would have exploded. I would have been yeah. strutting around. Well, the truth is I wouldn't have this following if I was like yeah. that. Yeah. That's the truth of it. You know, and we yeah. always find what we're looking for when we stop looking. Have you ever mm. noticed? It's it's incredibly true. This yeah. this last year and a half, and, and I would classify myself very much as a work in progress. And and I, I think that's probably true for every human being until the day we die. We're all a work in progress until the day we die. Yeah. Um, but this last year and a half has been really interesting. And I've commented before in, in other slow chats. I am more comfortable in my own skin now than I've ever been before in my life. And yes, it's it's definitely a struggle. My ego jumps up and tries to tries to do its thing from time to time. And sometimes it gets the better of me and I have to look at what I've said or done and go, oh, okay, got, need to learn from that. I'm not I'm not pretending that I've made it or or perfected this, but there is something about the battle that has been happening in the last year and a half. And let, let me put it to you this way, and I'd love to hear your feedback on this. Um you know, your, your wife's a psychologist. We might need to get her on here to psychoanalyze me a little bit. But I, I think men are somehow wired to need to be fighting for something. And, and I think that that's always been the case for me. My Two of my older brothers were in the Army Reserves, and it just made sense to me. I was going to join the Army Reserves, and I had no desire. Well, actually, that's not true. I actually did have a desire to go into combat when I was a younger man. I look back on that and go, really? You idiot. But, you know, that's that's who I was. Um. I left the army very disillusioned after only a couple of years. I was in the reserves. I, I left very disillusioned. And then a few years later, I was approached by the reserves and asked if I would re-enlist. Uh, they, they needed more members and they were trying to attract back. It wasn't just me. It was across the board, you know, trying to attract back people that had left. I left with an honorable discharge and it was all fine and I, I could have gone back in. And I found it really appealing. And I had this this need, I wanted to be back in there, but I knew what I'd seen and what was had disillusioned me and why I'd left. And I was struggling. So I went to my, um, in, within the church that I was in at the time, we had small groups, little Bible study groups that met during the week. And my, my Bible study leader was a, a good man, not, not a lot older than me, but a good man with a good head on his shoulders. And I talked it through with him. And, and what we realized was that I had a need to fight not to fight physically, I'm, I'm not that way inclined, but to be in a battle that's important and to try and make some sort of a difference. And what he said to me was, you can do that outside of the army. You don't have to be in the army to actually be making a difference. The, the urge, the thing that's attracting you to the army is applicable across many different areas. And so I didn't re-enlist. And I then kind of went through the next few years thinking, okay, then what is my fight? What is that thing that I'm going to do that's going to make a difference? And I ended up starting this Topher thing, which was accidental, and I won't retell the story, but I never set out to become Topher. I, that wasn't – the very first video I made was actually was actually kind of on a lark because my cousin said that I should apply for a particular thing. I won't retell the story, but it, it wasn't a strategy. It wasn't intentional. And one thing led to another, and I kept on making videos and only ever had a very small following. And um, – you know, I was happy just doing that as a little side thing and, and feeling like I was trying to make a difference. I ended up in the corner of, of the farmers and on, on water issues and water rights. And then along came COVID and it blew up to be what I think is one of the big battles of my generation. This, this moment right here, when you look at the legislation that's in front of the Victorian parliament right now, I think this is the fight of my generation. Uh, yeah. We are fighting, you know, what we used to send soldiers overseas to fight against is now happening right here at home. It's a fight and, of my generation too, and I'm not even in Victoria anymore. Yeah. And something about that and the fact that when I was faced with that fight, I didn't step back from it. I stepped into it. And I, I, I leaned in. I've now been arrested and charged with so-called crimes. Uh, I've been at protests that were supposedly illegal when, when the police were, were known to be very trigger happy. And I still fronted up and I still showed up. And there's something about that journey for me if I can put it this way, and this is what I'd love to get your thoughts on, I feel like I've passed a test. I, 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 I feel like, you know what, you know what I feel like, and I'm only just putting this, I feel like I've had that initiation. You have. And I, I feel well, like I can now fine. say, I'm a man, and I've got the runs on the board to prove it. Yep, you've had a baptism of fire, Topher. Yeah, and it's, it, it, it's, it's just fascinating. How do we get more young men to channel that desire, that drive to make a difference, to be in a fight in the right way? I By didn't have anyone. To... Sorry? By doing it ourselves. 
by modeling it, setting that example. Yeah, just by doing it ourselves. And you know what? Um, being something that they want to aspire to. Right. And that doesn't mean being covered in tats and bulking up and taking yeah. steroids. Yeah. And, you know, watching porn and getting all fired up and, you know, the whole porn thing, that's a whole other story as well. I mean, there, there are yeah. young teenagers who are killing themselves because they can't measure up to what they see on the on the porn that they watch. Yeah, yeah. You know, girls who are thinking they've got to do those things, they've got to behave like a porn star. Yeah. For the boys. And the boys thinking she's not going to like me because I can't be like this stud. Yeah. And it, just, yeah. it, and, and it destroys relationships. There's so many things. Porn is one of the greatest detriments to mm. uh, our society. And we don't even... We play around the edges of it, but it's it's an absolute cancer mm. on relationships, you know. Mm. Um, and but you know we we have to we have to take kids out of that modelling, and and the hero modelling that's based on sports stars. Um, you know they need to see the heroes as, you know, my dad was a hero because he went to war for five years. Yeah, he wow. fought the Japanese and he fought the Germans and the Italians. Mm. But not because of that, because he was, he called himself a navvy. He was, um, he drove earth moving equipment and he worked his guts out every day, all of his life to make sure that we had the best we could. Now that, that's why my dad's a hero. Yeah. And uh, we need to look up to our, the men that do that and do it with a smile on their face because they are the heroes mm. and they're not looking for gratification in other ways. And my dad used to do his block every now and then with me. He'd curl his tongue up and raise his hand, but he very rarely ever hit me. And yeah. when he did, I deserved it. And, you know, he wasn't always there for me. Like um, I, I, my big desire as a boy was to go fishing all the time. And my right. dad only ever went fishing with me probably four times in my whole life. Yeah. Even as a grown man, I took him away on a one-week fishing trip with me and we spent a bit of time in the boat together. And it was painful because he didn't really want to be there. Uh, but... <laughs> But you know what, um, my my dad gave it his all, and the one the beautiful thing my dad did for me before he died. When I became a Christian fifteen years ago, my dad was perplexed. He just thought, "What are you doing this for? You're going to become a wowser, a Bible basher. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, you're not going to have a beer with the old man and all this sort of stuff." Yeah, and and I said to him, "Dad, I need to do this." And years and years, he watched me with Michelle going through my faith journey and. I never opened a Bible in front of my dad because I knew that it would make him angry. Uh, I never preached to him, in other words. Mm. But then there was a time when uh, he had to go into a nursing home and um, and we got him into a good nursing home. And every Friday, I used to get Fridays and Saturdays off and I was landscaping on the property we had on the Gold Coast and I would go and get my dad out every Friday and we had a veranda all the way around our house and um, he'd sit on the veranda in his wheelchair and watch me, you know, building a rock wall or something. And every couple of hours, I'd come up for a cup of tea with him and I'd wheel him around while Michelle was boiling the kettle. I'd wheel him around the, the veranda. And every time I passed the kitchen window, I'd lean over to him and say, um, I really love you, Dad. And he'd say, I really love you too, son. <laughs> Anyhow, this would go on religiously every Friday. And then one yeah. day he said to me, he would, he would bring things up like, you remember when you were going to that high school and you did this and that? And I said, no, I don't remember that. Oh, yeah, you know. I remember that time your mother and I did this and did that. And I, and I thought, what? What are you doing? This went on for weeks. And I mm. sat him down one day and I said, you're reliving your life in slow motion replay, aren't you? And he said, yeah. He said, it's going through my head a bit. I said, are you trying to tick all the boxes before you die? Mm. And he said, I never thought of it that way, but I probably am. Yeah. Anyhow, the next Friday I'm wheeling him around again and I said to him, I loved him, and he said, can you sit with me for a minute? And I said, yeah, I sat down. And he held my hand and he stroked the back of my hand and he said, son, you're ten times a better man and a better father than I ever was. Wow. And he said, "And he said, I thank God for that. I thank wow. God for that. In other words, your faith has made you that man. Yeah. And I said to him, wow, Dad. And he said, no, it's true. And I said, well, you know, you've seen God work miracles in my life. He said, I have. I said, are you prepared to accept him before you die? Wow. And he said, I am. And he did. And anyhow, then about six months later, he's in the nursing home and he was declining pretty badly and uh, we got a call to go in there. 
and uh, we raced in and my dad was uh, comatose. Uh, he was lying on the bed. He had white hair like mine and deep piercing blue eyes and his face was like a skull covered in skin. It was There was no flesh on his bones. and He was looking at the light in the ceiling and his mouth was opening and closing like a goldfish. And, um, mm. and my stepmom was sitting beside him with a palliative care nurse and Michelle's a registered nurse as well as a psych. And, and when we walked to the door and we looked at him, um, the palliative care nurse said to me, I think I think uh, it's too late. He's sort of lapsed into a coma. He's not even going to know you're here. And Michelle said, Bull, he'll know you're here. And when he heard my voice, I saw his eyes flicker towards the door. And I went over to him and I looked down at his beautiful blue eyes and he's staring with fear into my eyes. Mm. And I stroked his lovely white hair like this and I said to him, um, you're scared, aren't you, mate? And he sort of blinked like in, in agreement. And I said, Dad, just one more sleep, just one more sleep, that's all. And I said, I want you to know that you're the best father I could have ever had and I'm so proud to call you my dad. And with that, he trembled. His whole body trembled and his right hand came up like this and he touched my face. And with that movement, I used to think every time my dad got me to told me he loved me, it was always because I had to do something for him. I never felt that he really did. But when he did that to me that day, he proved to me that every time he told me that he loved me, he meant it. And I got that just before my dad died because he died a few minutes after that. And my dad gave me the greatest gift I could have ever had. Mm. And I thank him for that. I thank God for that gift because that, drew a line through all the things, all the animosities we held together. It was all sorted out at the 11th hour. Mm. And I'm, a, I'm such a better man because my dad was vulnerable with me. I'm so much better. I learned all, I learned from all his mistakes because he never tried to hide them. He used to wear his heart on his sleeve too. I'm a lucky mm. man. I'm a blessed man. I really am. Graham, I, I'm going to just clean myself up a little bit here. Um, Smoke in your eyes. That's your problem. <laughs> yeah, smoke. Yeah, that's right. It was the smoke. It was the smoke. Someone's cutting onions near here. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing. That That is a, a beautiful um, and, and a powerful story. Um, normally what I do around about now is I, I call time for a, a break and I play a video and none of the videos that I have feel even remotely appropriate for this conversation as i always tell people you can't predict where a slow chat's going to go well this is this is living proof that you cannot predict where a slow chat is going to go i am loving every single minute graham do Me you too. need a break do you need a break ah. for a couple of minutes before we come back okay so no, I'm viewers I mean, i'm sorry I'm, uh, fine. I, I'm sorry there's no break today because i'm good to keep on going as well uh yeah. if you need to toddle off to the loo i had people complaining early in during early slow chats i had people commenting and complaining saying you've got to give us a break we, we can't we can't carry the laptop into the toilet with us well i'm sorry well, on the bed because they've stopped commenting ages ago no 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 i stopped putting them up because and i i meant to mention at the time but we kind of the conversation just kept going i because um marcus isn't able to be with us tonight i've been doing the comments and i'm just finding it's distracting me from you and from what you're saying and i just wanted to engage better with you and so i actually uh, the comments are, are flying thick and fast i'm going to go through and read them afterwards so please keep them coming um i, I really do appreciate it but this yeah. is this is too important of a conversation for me to be looking at the comments and putting them on the screen and that sort of stuff so i apologize uh, yeah. but please keep them coming we'll, we'll we'll read them later um okay so graham you talked about what happened at the 11th hour with your dad now i, I want to bring it back to some more current events and and what you mentioned earlier and that is that so many people are missing out on that now because of COVID restrictions and not being able to be there in those those moments. What what is the you know people try and pretend that oh, it's only money you know I don't care about your business I don't care about your job it's only money we're saving lives here. What's really being cost? What's really being lost? What's the real cost here with all the lockdowns and everything else? Well, we've already talked about the one big one. I mean, I've been saying a lot lately, uh, Tafer, that. Uh, the real virus here is not, um, the real pandemic is not uh, COVID, it's fear. And yeah. uh, the driving force behind that is the media, uh, mainstream media that's totally out of control. No, yep. they're not. They're totally in control. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Totally uh, we've got 
uh, you can bet your bottom dollar that Daniel Andrews, if he's got a father still alive, he'll be seeing him. He'll be there'll be none of those yeah. restrictions applying to Daniel Andrews in Victoria. Of course, yeah. Um, you know, we uh, I've got uh, at the uh, with our blended family, Michelle and I have six kids and twenty one grandkids. Yeah, right. Um, and five of those are in Western Australia with eighteen of our grandkids. Yeah. And my daughter, my lovely daughter Sarah, is up in Brisbane uh, with her her husband. Uh, and three beautiful grandkids, and yeah. they may as well be in, on Mars because I can't yeah. get in near them. Yeah. And um, unless I'm jabbed, there's no way I will ever see our kids and grandkids in Western Australia mm. because I'm not going to be able to go there. Mm. Now, that to me is reprehensible. Now, the cost of that is just immeasurable. You cannot measure what this is costing us because they're only holding up case numbers and death rates. Yeah. You know, 2,300 yeah. people in Victoria have got COVID and 11 or 12 have died. And everyone goes, shock horror. Yeah. yeah. And you look at the, you look at that and work the percentages out, 11 or 12 have died. Most of those with underlying comorbidity have mm. died with COVID, not of COVID. Yeah. Out of 2,200 a day that are getting it in the most locked down city in the world, which proves that it's yeah. not been working. Yeah, Daniel, are you listening? Yeah, you're not listening, are you? You're just not. <laughs> you're such a cute little. Oh, I love to. Anyway, yeah. Um, at the end of the day, we're in this situation that is doing more harm than good. Uh, so that the the, the um, fear pandemic has several variants. The first one mm. is the suicide variant. The second one is the domestic violence variant. The third one is the raging addiction variant. Yeah. The fourth one is the uneducated children variant. Mm -hmm. The fifth one is the mental illness variant. Mm. I can go on and on and on. The broken business variant, the broken mm. marriage variant. Mm -hmm. And none of those stats get mentioned. Dan, you might like to think about mentioning some of those in your 11 yeah. o'clock briefing. Yeah. You know what? That might put all of this into some serious perspective. Uh, yeah. But you won't, you won't, because that doesn't suit your agenda. Mm. And your agenda is pretty clear. Uh, any thinking person can look at what you're doing and understand what's driving it. You're an absolute narcissistic control freak, and you've got to admit it. I've had to admit to my faults in my life to get better, and you've got some yeah. healing to do, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. You need to start seeing you for who you really are and who the rest of the country is starting to see you. You're no longer the hero of the 2019 bushfires. No. You become a puppet of China. You're following the mandates and the and the uh, the example of your hero in China. Um, and you're making your people compliant like he has. Mm. Um, and what you're doing is causing more harm than you'll ever imagine. And on your head be it, Daniel, and one day mm -hmm. you're going to have to face the piper on that. Yeah. But it's not too late for you to turn that around, you know. If you step Correct. up to the parliament podium and said, you know what, I think we got this wrong. Yeah. I think we need to get Victoria back to its thriving best again, make it be the most livable city in the world and again. deal with this in a rational, a sensible way. Mm. But you won't, Daniel. You won't. And I, I, I'm sad that you won't. Um, yeah. It's a crying shame because a lot of people are paying the ultimate price to support your ego, and that's yeah. really, really sad. And I feel for you. I want to um, I want to bring up this comment here that I did uh, that I did stumble across just now. Time is stolen. Time is precious. Um, that's the real cost. Is the oh. time? I mean, we all have a very limited amount of time. We don't know how much we've got. Everyone's got a different amount. We don't know when that comes to a close. But we have a certain amount of time, and years of our lives have been stolen from us in terms of time with family, uh, et cetera, time pursuing our dreams and, and our visions. Uh, young people who may have had ambitions in sports or ambitions in business or ambitions in their education that have now been set back. And in, for many of these people, they'll never be able to get back onto the path that they were on before. But also, when, when we talk about money, we are again talking about time. You know, we, we talk about a small business that goes under this is, you know, potentially a family or a couple that have poured, let's say, 10 years of their life into this. And now the business is gone, their savings are gone, their house is possibly gone. 
we we've just stolen 10 years of of their working lives we've we've potentially damaged their retirement beyond repair i mean it, you you cannot say oh it's only money oh it just just sit at home for a while and it'll all be better that's that's not how life is that's not how life works and we've never done that for anything else in the past and it just it makes no sense that we're doing that for this now what is your hope and and I know you're you're a man of faith, and 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 that tends to mean that you're a man with with hope in your heart. I mean, that's what faith is, isn't it? It's it's we we, we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have hope uh, in in the salvation that He offers by grace through faith. Yeah. Um, what is your hope for the future of Australia? Is is there without being without being silly, without just being optimistic for the sake of optimistic? Realistically, how can we come out of this? And not just re, not just get back to where we were in 2019. How can we get out of this and actually build a better country than we would ever have had if this hadn't happened? In the same way as you talk about how you've come out of your background, you've learned lessons, you've found forgiveness, and you're a better man now than you would have been you know, without that. How can we be a better country than we would have been without going through this experience? We've got to bring the higher power back in. We've got to bring God back in. Whatever your... Yeah. Whatever your version of God is, uh, I, for me, there is only one, and I, I, I know him. I don't mm. believe he exists. I know he exists for me, mm. and that's mm. where I stand, and that's fine. Yeah. But we have de in our society. Um, we have enacted legislation, especially in Victoria. Daniel Andrews mm. is, uh, is clearly an atheist and yeah. clearly, uh, clearly is doing a lot of damage um, you know, the, the the statement he made about Margaret Court, like or, or loathe Margaret Court, I mean, the yeah. statement he said, he would not give her, allow her to breathe oxygen because she's full of hate and she turns people against one another. Well, if that isn't the pot calling the kettle black, I don't know what it is. I mean, <laughs> goodness sake, you know, live yeah. with your own speech. Um, yeah. yeah. Margaret Court stated her beliefs and some of those beliefs hurt some people and you know, we we are we are averse to uh, we are very thin skinned in society nowadays. We um, we're we're averse to upsetting anybody. Political correctness is killing us. Yeah, it is killing us. Yeah, God is the answer, Rabina. You're right. God is the answer. We yeah. I can I can choose now which gender I prefer to be. Uh, yeah. I can in many states now choose if I'm terminally ill when I will die. Yeah. But I cannot choose against this vaccine without paying an incredible price for yeah. my action. Um, and when we take God out and we put self ahead of everything else, you know, for me, I, I used to think that Christianity was, there's no way I could live into that lifestyle because um, the Ten Commandments, I mean, how can anyone keep those? And I find them now a blessing. The first four are about honouring God. The first four commandments, right down to the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's Saturday. Yeah. And I, I worship the Sabbath day. The mm. fact is that the rally I'm attending on Sunday, the Reclaim the Line rally on the Tweed, and I'm so looking forward to seeing some of our viewers at, at, at the rally. Please come and tell me you listen to this conversation. Mm. Um, that was to be held on Saturday the 6th. And uh, the organisers contacted me. Now, Reclaim the Line Rally is going global this time around the world at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And they'd already set it. They'd started doing the banners and data, set it all in motion. And the organiser said to me, um, she said, can you be the guest speaker at the Tweed, at the Tweed border again? And I yeah. said, I'd love to. When is it? And she said, it's on Saturday the 6th of November. And I said, ah, oh, mm. uh, I can't. That's God's day. And she said, mm. what do you mean? I said, well, that's just, the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And that, and if, if anything in me makes me any kind of a man, that doesn't come from me. That comes from Jesus Christ. And I'm mm. not going to push that aside. I'll say, oh, look, Jesus, not today. If you don't mind, I've got to go to a rally. I'm not going yeah, to do I've that. I've got something more important to do. I've got, yeah. And I said, I'd love to be there, but I will not break my Sabbath. That's breaking the fourth commandment. I won't do it. And anyhow, she said, well, think about it because you'll be doing good work, you know. And I said, I know, and I'll pray about it. And the next morning mm. I woke up and I said, I can't do it. And yeah. I contacted her and I said, I can't do it. And I told her why again. And 15 minutes they called me back and they said, that's okay, we'll change it to Sunday. <laughs> so the whole day, 
the whole day around the world was changed because I honoured God's Sabbath. And that for me yeah. is God saying, thank you. Yeah. I want you there and I want you and, and thank you for sticking up for me. Now, the mm. first four are about honouring God. You know, don't mm. worship idols and mm. there, there is no other God but me, da-da-da. And, and the last six about loving your neighbour yeah. as you love yourself. So the first four are about honouring something greater than you and the last six are about loving each other. So mm. if Jesus said it himself when he was asked, which are the two great commandments? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul mm. and love your neighbour as you would love yourself. Mm. They are, the, they are the two. And when you think about that, they cover all the others. So yeah. the Ten Commandments are a recipe for good living. Um, and if we all honoured them, like if we didn't steal and we didn't lie and we didn't commit adultery and we didn't murder, mm. all the things that our laws of the land are based on, if we acted mm. those out in our, in our everyday thinking, if we filled ourselves with the fruits of the Spirit, you know, patience, love, and peace and, and all those things, and, you know, and if we went to 1 Corinthians 13, which is, you know, love is patient, love is kind, love keeps no track of wrongs, love is not mm. boastful, uh, mm. love is always there. If we just followed the example that Jesus came to show us, we would love the man on our right. Yeah. And if everybody loved the man on his right, you and I would have nothing to talk about. Yeah. Daniel Andrews would be, I don't know, driving a bus. <laughs> In China. Which, is what, which, which is what he's much more qualified for. Um, so Sky Ads has asked this question. Now, Sky Ads is a, is a regular viewer of mine. G'day, mate. Um, and he he actually flies a plane with a banner behind it. You might have seen pictures of some of the oh. and the banners that he that he has. All right. Wait, now, he's were you up at the last border rally. Was he at the last border he, rally? Yeah. So he's up in your neck of the woods. And he's asked, and he's asked me before, and I, I don't have great ideas on this stuff. So I wanted to make this a topic of conversation between you and I. What should be on his banner for that rally at the border on Sunday? Well, he might have to have a long banner. <laughs> you know what? You might, Sky Edge, you might get something out of this when I say what I'm about to say. You cannot mandate somebody to love you. Daniel Andrews cannot mandate that he will win the le next election. He's angling for it with this legislation. Mm. But you cannot order somebody to love you. Love is something that is gained by freedom of choice. Now, we were created by God to love and be loved. End of story. Mm. So in order for that to happen, God has to give us free choice. So freedom of choice is valued by God. Mm. So God gives us voices for choices. Um, Sky ads, God gives us voices for choices or just voices for choices if you don't want to be religious. <laughs> um, that's what this is all about. It's got nothing to do with vaccines or health. Mm. It's about us making a clear choice based on informed consent. And yeah, tap, tap, God wins. Yeah, God yeah. God ultimately will win. You asked me what I saw for the future. Um, and I know any anybody who studies the Bible knows that we're living in the time of the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is quite clear about um, we don't have an awful lot of time left. We don't know when the end is coming, but we know that eventually the battle between good and evil will be fought out and good will win and evil will lose. Yeah. So we have to choose today who we will serve. Will we serve good or will we serve evil? There's no sitting on the fence in the battle between good and evil. Yeah. So I'm looking at what we're doing as winning time to get more people to see what really matters so that they can make choices between good and evil in their future. Because at the moment, a lot of people are making bad choices or no choices, which is a bad choice. Now, you also talked to me, Topher, about uh, you see me as having a, a strong moral compass. Now, the thing about a moral compass is it's good to have, but it's no good without maps. Because true. all a compass does is point you to true north. It makes no account for the chasms and swamps and oceans and cliffs that you'll encounter along the way. Okay. We have to deviate around the obstacles in our moral compass to head to the moral north that we want to go to. And that means we have to make we have to make allowances for a whole lot of things that get thrown at us. But we still have to make allowances based on the choice between good and evil. Yeah. You know, it's a line in a movie um, which I loved for it was called uh, Orlando Bloom was in it. It was called uh, Kingdom of God, Kingdom of Heaven about the oh, yes. crusade. Yeah. And Bali in the Night, who was played by Orlando Bloom, um, 
he um, he got to Jerusalem uh, after his wife killed herself uh, in in a blacksmith shop that he he was running in France, and that he made the pilgrimage, and he went up to the hill at uh, Calvary where 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 uh, Christ was crucified, and he spent the night up there. And when he came back, his mentor Knight was waiting in the apartment in Jerusalem for him, and said, "Where have you been, Bailey?" And he said, "I've been up on the." on the hill where Christ was crucified. He said, "What? why you be there? And he said, it, I was looking for my religion and it seems I've lost my religion. And the old knight said to him something that really strikes a chord with me. He said, oh, right. I put no stock in religion. In the name of religion, I've seen the lunacy of men of every denomination be called the will of God. Mm -hmm. What God requires is here and here and whether you choose to be good or not. And at the end of the day, you don't have to be super religious. You have to be in relationship. Yeah. I don't think Jesus wants us to be religious. I think he wants us to be in relationship with him and each other mm. based on our choices of what's good and what isn't. And mm. if we wake up every morning, if the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is look at your partner beside you and say, yeah. how can I love her more today than I did yesterday? Then you're yeah. setting a framework to live in good and your partner will benefit and you will benefit. There are simple things we can do to make those choices every day. And we have to get back to that to bring hope back to our country. We have to make the little choices that make the big ones look so profoundly good. There's a there's an analogy for that uh, that I think is really useful mentally. Uh, and it was actually, the analogy was to do with time. It was someone talking about business management and time and that sort of thing. But I think it applies to, to choices as well. And he took a jar and he filled it up with a whole bunch, oh, sorry, he filled it up with water. And he had large stones and he had small stones and he had the water and the jar was full of water. And he dropped one of the large stones into the water and of course the water all splashed out around the edge. And he said, think of the water as the small things. Like water is, you know, a, 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 an atom of water is so is so small we can't even see it with the naked eye and it's it's a liquid. And when you fill something up with, with water, it's full. It's not compressible even. You cannot get anything else in there. The minute you put something else in there, something splashes out. If you think of the water as the tiny little decisions, okay, the little, the day-to-day the -day little things, and then the small pebbles, slightly bigger decisions, and the big pebbles, they're the big important decisions that change the direction of our life and really are ultimately the things that, that get us through life and to where we want to go. If you fill the jar with water first and you allow your life to be taken up with all the little things, you don't have room for the big things. But if you put the big pebbles in first, it looks like the jar is full, but now you can put the sand, the, the, the gravelly sort of stuff in and shake it in and it fits. It finds its way in. And it's now you can pour a whole bunch of water in as well. Great. Right? Yeah. And I, I think when it comes to moral choices, when it comes to making the right choices, getting those big choices right, like you said, that then leads to everything else kind of falling into place. We find room for all the other stuff. The problem is we've been trained by our culture to to just be completely distracted by all the little things all the noise you know my kitchen rules you, you mentioned before you know we it is very easy to fill your life right now it is very easy to have no time left no headspace left that doesn't mean that your life is full of important things and making room for the important things first the other stuff finds its place in and and around that and i yeah i, I think that's probably a useful sort of visual framework for for what you're talking about there it actually is i, I love that analogy i've never heard that one before i think it's amazing yeah no, it's uh, well you're, you're you're welcome to borrow it from me because i borrowed it from somebody else and shamelessly stole it and i don't, I don't even remember where i got it from yeah all my stuff's mostly borrowed too so let's just share it around you know it's made hey, around to go around solomon said there's nothing new under the sun you know, if, it. and if, if it came from the wisest man who ever lived, then I'm good with that. I'm I'm happy. He was happy to dark when he said that. He was in a dark place when he said Ooh. all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah. Song of Solomon. Uh, I mean, the Proverbs, obviously, in Song of Solomon. You know, and and you're looking at the life of David. I mean, we were talking about broken people before, okay, and the fact that everyone is broken. If we can just get super religious for a second here and actually talk about someone from from the Bible, you look at David, described by God as a man after God's own heart. Yep. Um, sorry. Some of what he did was incredibly messed up. Yeah. I mean, incredibly messed up. Yeah. And yet somehow he, I mean, and, and then when he was challenged by, was it the prophet Isaiah at the time? I, or, no, 
Samuel, I always get them mixed up. He was challenged by the prophet over what he had done. He caught, he, he stole another man's wife, basically, um, by the power of being the king, stole his wife. And then when she fell pregnant and he realized he was going to be found out because Isaiah, her husband, was actually away at war at the time when she fell pregnant, he then sent Isaiah into an unwinnable battle. He basically basically commanded Isaiah and his men to go and get themselves killed so that he wouldn't have to get in trouble for the fact that he'd stolen Isaiah's, uh, sorry, not Isaiah, um, Uriah. Uriah's right. wife, excuse right. me, I, I, yeah, Uriah's wife, and uh, didn't want to get in trouble over that. And um, Uriah died in battle, and the prophet came, whichever prophet it was, came. And the analogy that he used was, there is a very rich man who has flocks of sheep, and he sees another man who has one sheep, and he covets that one sheep, and he steals it. And when the man comes back wanting his sheep, he has the man murdered. What should be done to this man? And David the king says, well, the death penalty should be done to that man, for, for the rich man, for stealing one sheep off a poor man. And the prophet turns to, to David and says, that man is you. Yep. And he's so convicted and he recognizes the analogy and he's so convicted by that that he then goes and repents. And this, I think, is the important, the important thing about moving forward. Yes, we, we talk about forgiveness in Western culture and forgiveness is incredibly important. But repentance actually recognizing within yourself that you did something wrong. Forgiveness is about the other person. It's about you did something wrong and I forgive you. Repentance mm -hmm. is about I did something wrong mm -hmm. and I repent and I'm sorry and I will change my ways. And because David was a man of repentance, he was still regarded by God as a man after God's own heart in yep. spite, in spite of all that he had done. Worse, if we put it on a scale, worse than anything I've ever done, and I've done some pretty shitty stuff over the years, right? He broke every commandment in the book. He broke every commandment, and yet he's still a man after God's own heart because he now had... What does, that, what does that say about the character of God? Well, one, God, when 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 people repent, God forgives. I mean, we... And doesn't he say that? He says, if, you've, yeah. if you repent, it's blotted out. I, I yeah. remember... Not. Does that yeah. mean that he's got amnesia? No. No, Does God knows everything. Promise. That no. if you repent, you'll be it'll be forgiven you. Yeah. That's yeah. So, you know, and he proved it later on uh, later on in the Bible, after David died, that there was a wicked king called Jeroboam who took over. Hmm. Uh, who took over uh, one of the kingdoms and, and eventually grew quite big. And he wasn't a man after God's own heart, he was a bit of a pig. And the prophet went to Isaiah, went to um, Jeroboam and said, um, God's not happy with you. He told me to tell you that um, you're nothing like his son David who did nothing wrong in his sight. And Jeroboam, yeah. Jeroboam yeah. said, hang on, you cut the grass. <laughs> he said, he broke every rule in the book. What are yeah. you talking about? And God said again, you're nothing like my son David who did nothing wrong in my sight. Now that either mm. proves that God's got amnesia or he really keeps his promise. Mm. So that gives me great hope that when mm. I think of something that I need to repent of and something I need to make amends for, that mm. I, I know God will keep his promise. And that makes me feel secure. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That, that I'd, I'd, I'd actually never quite connected those two, those two accounts. Um, I try not to call them stories. They're accounts. I'd never quite connected those two accounts. So thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. And somebody, somebody showed that to me once and I never forgot it. It's not, yeah. Because I'm a great st student of the Bible, I'm not very good at <laughs> Hey, like, like like we just said, there's nothing new. We all nothing learn from other people who've who've thought through this stuff for the, for whatever reason. Yep. Okay. In practical terms, let's 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 come right back to the practical reality of Australia as it is today. I have a lot of people saying to me, "What's the point in protest? There's no point protesting. What have you achieved? What are the protests achieving? You're obviously continuing to speak at these protests. You're obviously continuing to be active." Why? What are these achieving as far as you're concerned? Oh, I'm seeing cracks. Um, I'm seeing cracks. I mean, seeing 10 or 12,000 turn up at the steps of Parliament House with a police force that was lenient and obliging. Mm. I mean, apart from that, that twit that tried to cause trouble by jumping on the bonnet of the police car, I mean, the police had to arrest him. But, sure, you know, that, that could have really gone ugly. And let's not go down that road. No. You know, a senior constable, um, um, Craig Backman, stood mm. up and gave that stirring speech to the police. And I, I was texting him while he was in the crowd, what are you doing? Get up there, grab that microphone, talk to those yeah, coppers. Yeah, yeah. And I'm pretty sure he was going to anyway. Yeah. 
Uh, he said the, the most telling thing he said to them, I believe, was that these people who you're watching over at the moment are fighting for your freedoms too. Mm. Um, and he, I said, talk to him afterwards. I said, how was it? He said, none of them looked at me. They all looked at the ground. Yeah. You know what? These are these people are worried just like us. They've got careers. They've got paychecks. Um, it was good to see no shields and helmets there. The yeah. only helmets I saw were on a couple of motorcycle cops. Um, yeah. They they were they were really good. They were really restrained, and I think they were relieved because it, they weren't being forced to to follow a, a mandate that that Andrews had tried to dictatorially set out with that with that with the stormtroopers. I mean that was yeah. horrible. Yeah. And I'm talking to a lot of Victorian coppers, a lot of them, and there are hundreds of them who are feeling like um, like Craig is, and Craig is a standout uh, human being. And you yeah. know the sad part, he and he and Crystal uh, Mitchell, Sergeant yeah. Crystal Mitchell, their loss to the police force is immense because we're going to need in the rebuild, we're going to need men and women of integrity like those two, like never before, really. Yeah. yeah. I mean, either one of them should be commissioner. I, I you know, I, I think. Um, I think Crystal Mitchell's an absolute angel and she's such yeah. a loss to the force. And, you know, there's yeah. so many more that I'm talking to. So when in the rebuilding process, we're going to need those people back. We mm. really are. And I hope that they'll come back. There's a lot of rebuilding that's going to have to be done. But I, when I saw 10,000, 12,000 people there and I saw them um, rolling along like they were, and, and people listening, and there was an independent politician who said, right, I've had my speech now, it's time to move on. And everyone said, no, 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 we haven't finished yet. The best mm -hmm. speeches came after hers. Hers was good. Mm -hmm. But the best ones came later. And there was another hour and a half, I think, after that, where there were people yeah. speaking immense. The guy from Somalia, I mean, what yeah. an Aussie. What yeah. an absolute Aussie. Yeah. That's Jerry, and I, I have to thank my uh, Facebook page. If you're not on my Facebook page, if you're watching on um on Graham's, please jump across and, and like the Tofo Field Facebook page. And if you're on my page and you're not on Graham's, get across and like Graham's uh, page as well. But my audience are amazing. And I'm working on this documentary at the moment, and I didn't know who that was. And so I asked them to identify him for me. And I kid you not, probably 35 or 40 people sent me messages or made comments and, and gave me his Facebook page or his name or, or that sort of thing. And uh, oh, we had a chat. Good. Yeah, we, we had a chat on the phone yesterday, and he's agreed to come on the documentary. Um, right. Craig, Craig Backman is on the documentary, The Violinist. Um, yeah. uh, Mark Ma, Ma, I, I, I can't quite remember his name, oh. but um, he's... He made Australia cry. Yeah, he's, he's now in the documentary. These, these people, I've, right. I've invited them to come and, and the filming schedule, which starts on Wednesday and finishes on Sunday, is, is looking pretty chock-a-block full. These are going to be 12-hour days of, of filming uh, interview after interview after interview. And, um, you know... One of the really beautiful things that is just thrilling for me as someone who's been commentating on politics for 12 years and someone who, you know, when you live your life neck deep in politics, it can be very hard to stay optimistic because politics is not a pretty place. It's full of very unpleasant people who are doing very unpleasant things to others. But this moment, I am seeing so many good people rising to the top you know, so the, the cream sort of rising to the top, people coming out of the woodwork, people who I would never have met, whose names I would never have known, yourself included, Graham, right? This, you would never have, have come across my radar. You would never, we would never have had this chat and touched the, the yeah. at times, 1,400 people watching right now, over 1,200 people watching and many tens of thousands more that will watch it in coming days. This would never have happened. And I, I can't help but think of, you know, that cycle that they talk about. Good times breed weak men. Weak men breed bad times. Bad times breed hard men or strong men. Strong men breed good times. I can't help but feel like what's happening right now is good people. And it's not, not just males. When I say men, I say you know, mankind. There are good people rising up and standing up. And we need men specifically to do that. And, and many are. Um, but men and women are standing up and rising up and and we're seeing a strength that I think we didn't know we had. And in a very real sense, that gives me actually a lot of optimism for the future. We're in the fight of our lives right now and we need to win that. But if we manage to win this fight right now, I can't help but think that people like yourself are going to go on with the public profile that you've earned and you've gained through all of this. And you're going to keep on doing what you're doing. And Australia is actually going to be a better place in the long run because of people like yourself, people like Jerry, people like Craig Backman, 
who who suddenly Australia knows who they are, and we would yep. never have known that before. I'm going to say, and I'm, I'm not winding up by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm going to say just a huge thank you to you for your courage in that video and the choice that you made instead of just going quietly into the night, resigning, making your own choice about your own personal, you know, whether you want it to be jabbed or not, and then just going off quietly. You took the risk and you raised your voice. How do we encourage more people? A lot of people are afraid. They understand what's going on. They know what's right. I was talking to someone today who thankfully has agreed to come on the documentary now, but I, I had about a half an hour conversation with someone today who was saying to me, I want to come on the documentary. Their story is, is incredibly relevant and incredibly powerful. And they're saying to me, I want to, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what they'll do to me. I'm afraid that they'll come for me. I'm afraid that Daniel Andrews, if he gets these powers, will come for me. And I, I understand that fear. I mean, I'm, yeah, hello, I've had the police outside my door more times in the last month, in the last two months than I've had the rest of my life combined. I understand I that those. fear. Yeah. 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 How how do we, what can we say to people to help them find that courage? Because for every Craig Backman, for every Graham Hood, for every Topher Field, there's another five or 10 or a hundred people who could be you and could be me. But they're not making that choice and they're not stepping up. What do we say to those people? I'll say to them what I've experienced since I spoke up. Um, sure. I've never felt so much love and support in my entire life. Um, I feel incredibly honoured by the responses that I've had for speaking up. And you know what? I'm um, If four black land cruisers came up the driveway tonight and took me off um i'd go peaceably i'd just say okay and i'd sit it out somewhere until somebody came to their senses or i'd i mean i'm just quite prepared i'm not mm. stirring up i'm not um inciting violence i'm inciting people to uh realize their potential i'm motivating mm. people to realize that they have immense power um and and i I just, for me, it's, um, I think I'm living in the greatest moment of my life. Mm. And Craig is, and Alex is, and Johnny Larta, you know, the, mm. the paramedic who's fighting Brad Hazard at the moment. Um, he, he's locked in the court system and everything, and the rest of us are not so much locked in the court. You know, Christian Mack, uh, the teacher, Big Mac, I did an interview with him today on for his channel. And guys like yourself, you know, and and Joel, Jamal, and and mm -hmm. um, you know, RV, and all yep. these great people, and Monica, far yep. out. Yeah, I mean, we are looking at a at a at a new breed of people from all walks of life. I spent three hours on a Zoom today with 150 incredible human beings. Most of them are well known, uh, sporting stars, AFL stars. Yeah, surfing. Um, and they're forming voices for choices. And these are incredible people, uh, media personalities, actors. And I watched some of them talking about the ends of their careers coming up in just days and crying. Yeah. yeah. They were crying. I saw an AFL footballer who's revered by many crying. Yeah. Um, the, these, I had, I had one celebrity uh, the previous week when I was in the same group, um, I won't mention her name. I I thank them all for including me in the group because I felt very inadequate in many ways. And I said, all I did was make a video. And this woman came on and she said, I thank God you made that video because that night I was going to kill myself and your video oh, stopped. Wow. Me. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, we, we, I'm seeing great hope there. There are a lot of people out there who are stepping up. There are a lot of people just holding back. Yeah. But I love that feeling of fear, the fear feel the fear and do it anyway. And fear yeah. is false evidence appearing real. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I, and Michelle's my greatest strength on earth. I mean, she just says, agrees with me. You know, we would rather live in a tent and stand up mm -hmm. than live in a seaside mansion on our knees. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's about what you value. And I can understand people thinking, oh, like pilots. Oh, man, mm. if I go to a rally at the airport, I'm toast. They're just going to, yeah. I'll never get back in, you know. Yeah. 
Yep. I can understand that. I can understand somebody being coerced like somebody I spoke to tonight who's been desperately trying not to get it. Mm. But she's working in aged care and she, she really loves the people she works for and she feels desperate. She doesn't want to be excluded from those people because she feels they mm. need her. Mm. So she's making a sacrifice for them mm. out of love. Mm. Mm. And, um, and I said to her, you know, no matter what you do, and I say this to any of your, any of our viewers tonight, Whatever choice you make, for whatever reason you make, if you're coerced, and by now, if you're forced to get it, you have been coerced. Yeah. They win if you give them your spirit. You have to make your decisions, and God bless you. And you yeah. are in my prayers. You're in a lot of people's prayers because we know that you're not doing this willingly, and we mm. know that you're living in your circumstances and we're not, and we yeah. honour your choice. But do not, do not look at me. Look at me. Do not give away your spirit to these mm. to these people. Mm. I'll, I'll finish that sentence for you. Do not give away your spirit to these bastards. You couldn't Thank say you. it, but I will. <laughs> Thank you. Don't let them have it. They do mm. not deserve it. They have mm. not earned it. They have mm. not earned your respect, and they do not have not earned your spirit. So hang on to it. Don't mm. let it go, and keep looking up. Yeah. You know what? I saw something today that made me feel really, really immensely solid. Uh, Satan saw me with my head bowed and thought he'd won until I'd said amen. Mm, yeah, hundred percent. Look, I'm going to yeah. get a little bit, a little bit uh, religious here, and look, make of it what you will. Everyone watching, make of it what you will. Um, but many years ago, I I was in prayer and asking God for direction, and God very clearly said to me do the thing that is in front of you just do the thing that is in front of you mm -hmm. and this was not long after i made my first tofu video which like i said um was a lark i didn't do it with a strategy in mind i've never had a strategy in mind i'm literally in the last two months i've finally actually gone you know what this tofu thing people seem to want it they seem to appreciate it so maybe i should take it more seriously than what i have over the last 12 years and i've actually started to put people around myself uh, I'm very good in certain areas and extremely bad in other areas. And so I'm hiring people to make up for my deficiencies. And, you know, you, people have seen the branding has changed and you're going to see the content changing. Now this documentary is happening. There's a lot happening as a result of that decision about two months ago. But for 12 years, I literally just did the thing that was in front of me. And it led me to this point and led me to this moment where all of a sudden, for whatever reason, and this is why I've left this comment here, you know, here I am, God, send me. Mm, thank you, Denise. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't strategize my way into being, you know, among the more prominent, I'm, you know, I don't want to big note myself, but into being among the more prominent freedom fighters in Victoria. I didn't, I didn't strategize my way into this moment in my life. But I have found myself married to a woman who is 100% in my corner. And if anything, I'm the one toning her down. I'm like, okay, babe, just, you know, <laughs> right? You know, and there are people who are married and, and, and it's a civil war now because they're on opposite sides of this issue. And by the grace of God, I didn't, I didn't have that. By the grace of God, somehow I've ended up with a platform and, and people that appreciate what I have to say and how I say it. Um, and, and I find myself here not through strategy, not through the wisdom of man, but because I just did the thing that was in front of me, which I believe was what I was instructed to do all those years ago. Just do the thing that's in front of you. I didn't make grand plans. I just did the thing that was in front of me. And, and it's led me to this moment here. And I, I really want to encourage anyone that's thinking about speaking out, anyone that's, that's worried about the consequences, worried about the future. You know what? Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Let the troubles of tomorrow take care of themselves. Amen right just do right now what you believe needs to be done and what you will be proud of in 10 years time when the consequences whatever they are are history mm. what will you be proud of and what will you look back on and say i am so glad i did that i feel wow. like the last 18 months have defined me in a way that no other period of my life has and if this fight is the defining fight of my life, I'm okay with that. I will look back on my deathbed whenever that comes, because none of us know, whenever that is, I will look back 
And I will know that when history called on me to do something, to be somebody, to stand up and to make a difference, that I answered that call and I met that challenge. And I will be proud for the rest of my life of who I have been. I could spend the rest of my life in prison under Daniel Andrews' draconian laws for all I know. Okay, I don't know what the future holds. I'm willing to take that risk because what I don't want is to get to my deathbed and be saying, what if, if only, what if I'd had the courage? What if I'd spoken up? Graham? I, I think Daniel Andrews will be the one in charge, to be honest with you. Um, I hope so. You are so on the money, you know, and what I've loved about this journey in the last few, you've been doing this for 18 months. I've only been doing it for, you know, three months is that it brings me into contact with men and women like you um, who make me immensely proud of our nation, mm. and immensely proud of our spirit and immensely proud of the opportunities that this is creating for so many of us. Mm. Uh, we, are, we are in the box seat. Now, whether that's, that gives us a vision of victory in in um, in obtaining the rights or maintaining the rights we've all enjoyed that our fathers have died for and our forefathers have died for will depend on whether we speak up now or not. Yeah. My friend who talked to me today, um, I've known for the last 15 years, he has, um, he said to me, I said to him, are you happy to live in a society where me, one of your best friends, is going to be segregated? Uh, and he paused. He paused and he said to me, um, well, I don't think it's going to be for long. I think by early in the new year, everything's going to be open and you're going to be fine. And I said to him, all right, let's say a year from now I'm still segregated. And mm -hmm. he'd say I'd be horrified. And I said, what would you do? He said, I don't know, but I'd be horrified. I said, well, if you don't want that to happen to me, then you've got to speak up now. Yep. And yeah. uh, he won't because he's uh, totally at odds with what I what I think. Uh, he said to me when we talked that I'm over exaggerating the suicide rates, and um, I'm kind of hoping that he's been watching the comments coming up tonight. Yeah, um, I, and, I didn't even put them all up. There were so many more, and I my apologies to those of you that shared your story in the comments. I just I felt that if I kept on putting them up, then then that that's all we were going to be talking about. I mean, you know. I know. I don't um, but my heart goes out to every single one of you. And and can I also say, Graham, thank you for the burden that you are sharing with others when people reach out to you and they share these stories. You know, I like I said, you, you're getting three times the messages that I am. Your page is absolutely nuts. Um, but I, I get a lot of messages and I do try to read them all. I don't reply to them all, but I do try to read them all. And Definitely. there is weight that comes with that there is there is a weight on the shoulders and and i know what it's like for me and i can only imagine what it's like for you given what you've done and 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 uh, hoodies heroes and so forth and hoodies helpers hoodies helpers excuse me hoodies helpers hoodies heroes sounds pretty good Sounds pretty good, although it's a little bit close to Hogan's Heroes, and I wouldn't yeah. really want that. <laughs> I wouldn't want that association. Bob, Bob Crane uh, was not really all that. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, but you you are carrying, you, you are not carrying, carrying is the wrong word. You are helping other people to unload their burdens in that. And yep. and I'm so grateful that, that, that you do that and, and that other people have that opportunity uh, with you. In terms of you know, we're fighting the fight that we're fighting. We, we're holding rallies. Uh, and by the way, can I just say as a Victorian, thank you to everyone that is rallying outside of Victoria, even when we, or especially when we can't. Like right now, okay, it looks like we can actually hold protests and, and people, the police aren't going nuts on us. I think that that's probably because Daniel Andrews is wanting to give us this feeling of, hey, we're free now. We can shop again. We can go to the shops while he rams through his absolutely awful draconian legislation. I, I, I'm a bit cynical about Daniel Andrews's motives for why we're able to protest right now. But regardless, I'm so grateful. Every time we see footage of these protests up on the New South Wales Queensland border or from New Zealand or from other parts of the world, it's so thrilling and so encouraging for us to know that we're not alone because, boy, it feels sometimes like we are 
absolutely alone in this fight. And then you get online and you see that sort of stuff. So when you guys are rallying, you're not just rallying for yourselves. Uh, and that's fine. Like rally for yourselves, rally for your freedoms. Absolutely. But please know you are rallying for us. And here in Victoria, the most locked down state on earth, we love nothing more than to see footage and to hear the chants and to read the slogans and the signs and sky ads to see your banner hanging off the back of your plane. Uh, nothing thrills us more than to see that stuff. So thank you from the bottom of my heart to everyone involved and, and to Absolutely. you, Graham. You are, you are helping us to carry our burden. I got a message from um, the lady who's organising a rally at the Tweed and she said, I want you to focus on the plight of the Victorians in your speeches. Yeah. The other thing is I watched with glee this morning the uh, protesters out the front of the Australian Embassy in London. Yeah. <clears throat> and the protesters in New York. And uh, I was on Stu Peter's and, program. And in Poland, by the way. And in Poland, yeah. And solidarity, you know, the solidarity movement started Lequilenza in, in Poland. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, I was uh, interviewed by Stu Peters for his program in America yeah. the other day. And yeah. that's released on my page last night. Um, it was meant to be talking about the aviation industry and we eventually got to it, but such was the mood of the country before the interview that I asked him, he asked me a question about aviation. I said, look, before we go there, can I tell you what's happening in our country? And I explained everything that's happening in Western Australia and then I moved mm -hmm. through South Australia quickly because that seems to be just drifting along and that's cool. Mm -hmm. And I got to Victoria and I, I leaned on what was going on in Victoria and then uh, up into New South Wales and then finished with Princess Palaszczuk. And I didn't get to Northern Territory, which is like <laughs> draconian plus. Mm -hmm. $5,000 fine if you don't get jabbed. For goodness sake, grow up. Um, yeah. So I, um, uh, I spent half the program highlighting the plight of what's going on in Australia and in particular Victoria. And he, they knew about it and he was horrified. Yeah. He was horrified. He actually said that Port Arthur was the worst thing that happened to us because it took our guns away from us. I mean, that's how the Americans think. Um, yeah. You know, he said, I'm so proud of the fact that 43% of all the guns privately owned in the world are owned by Americans. And I thought, well, you know, I, I can I can see where you're coming from, but we don't have, you know, a, a school massacre every week. Um, so yeah, there's a whole lot of ugly stuff around all of that kind of mm -hmm. thinking. but. But you can see why people get to that and you can see yeah. how people start to think, well, you know, this. what have I got to do to get my freedoms back? Yeah. So, uh, Victoria, you know what? If people, well, you're talking about people protesting and coming out, if we could only fight for our freedoms the way we fought for toilet paper. How yes. Good was I saw that. I saw someone say that yeah. earlier today and I'd not made that connection. I thought, wow. If we fought this legislation the way people fought each other for toilet paper, we would win this in forty-eight hours. Yeah, I don't. You know what? I, I think I don't think everybody in the Labor Party in Victoria likes Daniel Andrews. I think they're bullied by no. him. And I think no. I think I think they'll cross. And I think we're appealing to them. I'm praying that they will. And I'm praying, and I'm appealing to them every time I make a video. I made one last night, a, a prayer video, because a lot of people are asking me to do a, a daily prayer. I haven't had time to do one tonight because I've been on Zoom since nine o'clock this morning. But um, <laughs> I want to, I want people to know that um, I believe that there are enough people there who will come to their senses and cross the floor. And what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking is going on in Victoria. I think the hierarchy within the police, the senior officers, is starting to say, you know what, we can't, you can't get us to do this for too much longer. Yes, I agree I, with that. Yeah. I don't think Daniel Andrews is going lean. I think he's been told, you know, uh, there's only so much you can get out of these people. And, and uh, you know, we, well, we've lost too much. Craig Backman talks about how much has been lost from community policing because of what, what Andrews has made the cops do. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, we, yeah. We cried, I cried when those four police officers were run down by that truck on yeah. the freeway. You yeah. know, that broke your heart. Yeah, that broke your hearts, but there are a lot of people now who wouldn't even bat an eyelid if that happened, and that's really sad too. Because you know the way those police were treated by by Pusey or whatever his name is, mm -hmm. you know, in his, in his idiot, it was dreadful. He was mocking yeah. them while they were bleeding to death. I mean, for goodness' yeah. sake, yeah, that's no, that's look, not Australia. 
Yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And, and I think to reinforce your point, Victoria Police went public. And, and the significance of this is that they went public with a request to the Victorian government to r change the rules and facilitate protests again. Now, I would they argue... Did. Yeah, they did. I would argue that protest is a human right and there, there doesn't need to be rules in place. They should be facilitating protest. However, we have to deal with the world as it is in reality, not as it ought to be. And in reality, they've been taking their orders from Daniel Andrews and they've been shutting down the protests and they publicly appealed to the Labor government for a framework under which they could permit protests to happen again. And technically, the protests that are happening right now are not actually within the Chief Health Officer's directions because they exceed the maximum gathering size. So technically, the police, they have, they could move in the way that they've moved in on so many protests over the last year and a half, um, but they've, they've chosen not to recently. So I think there has been a shift in senior ranks of Victoria Police. I, I don't think these people are the good guys. I don't think they're our friends, but I do think they're reading the tea leaves and they're seeing where this is going and they're trying to, they're the rats abandoning the ship. They're the first rats jumping off the ship. Yeah. However, your comments on the Labor Party, I agree that Daniel Andrews is hated. I would go further than what you said, actually. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking what you said and going even further. I think he is hated by a lot of other Labor politicians. Here's the tricky thing. If they had torn Daniel Andrews down in the middle of last year, um, you know, when, when this lockdown number two was dragging on and on and on and so forth, they would have had time to rebuild before the election, which is set for November next year. I'm concerned that now, no matter how much they hate him, they don't want to drag him down because no one wants to be the person who becomes the replacement premier to Daniel Andrews less than a year out from an election where they're going to get their butts kicked. And I'm a little bit concerned now that because of the timing, they are going to sit tight. They're going to watch Daniel Andrews lose the next election, get rid of him out of the party, and then rebuild to try and win the following election. They the, can't afford that. <sighs> they can't afford that luxury, Topher. They can't. They cannot. They have to stop him now before this legislation. They have to. They can't put self-interest ahead of the people of Victoria. They have but, to. But they're politicians. Self-interest is all they have. I know. We need so, citizens in Parliament. Not so what, what I would say is the only thing now that I think can change this equation where they're not going to make a move is if they start to realize that they will lose their seat. If they realize that there is a swing so big that it's not just that the Labor Party will lose power, but they as a politician will lose their seat and their cushy salary and their easy job, then we might change the metrics a little bit. Now, I think we can get there and I think we can get there in a couple of months time and I think my, docu my documentary is going to help with that particular journey. But the focus now in Victoria needs to be on getting the Labor MPs to realise it's not just that Daniel Andrews is going to lose the next election. Yeah. They are going to lose their seats. And at that point, we might start to see some of them actually begin to stand up. But that's, that's a process. And I think it's a couple of months away before we can corner them yeah. to the point that they're going to reach that conclusion. You know what gives me great hope for federal politics is that you know, I've been talking to, uh, I've been lobbied by a few parties to to run. Um, of course, yeah, I'm in the I'm in the uh, New England electorate, and nothing would give me greater pleasure than to run against Barnaby Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would thoroughly enjoy that, but that'd be my ego running away with me, and and uh, I've I've chosen not to go into politics. But um, I've been courted by politicians who I'm starting to see some re real calibre in. I think. The minor parties have got some incredible caliber. Now, I'm going to talk about some of them without backing yep. them. Yep. I'm super impressed with um, with Rod Cullerton's Great Australia Party. Yep. Uh, because he is he is dedicated to restoration of the of the constitution. Yep. And he's got a candidate in Queensland who I would happily endorse because I've spent a lot of time talking to Jason Miles. Okay. Um, now, Jason Miles is going to be running for the Senate in Queensland. Now, he and I are kindred spirits. We've had some great chats together. He's uh, We sort of prop each other up. He desperately doesn't want to be in politics, but he feels he has to be. And the best sure. politicians and the best union leaders and the best chief pilots are the ones who don't want to be, right? They're not career politicians. If I, could hit, if, if I could hit replay on what you just said, so you said it again, I would. Spot on. We need yeah. politicians that don't want to be there. That's exactly right. So uh, uh, Rod and um, and Jason have joined forces, and they've also set up an organisation called CADCO, 
It's the CADCO is the Commonwealth of Australia Democratic uh, Cooperative, not Coalition yep. Cooperative. Now, yep. they're trying to get all the minor parties under one umbrella so they support each other to get government. Now, you've got you've got that sort of thing happening. Then you've got um, you've got Craig Kelly. Um, yep. and Craig Kelly is a man of great heart and great mm. courage. I mean, he's incredible. I love Craig. Yep. I, I did a, a, we did a, who was it with? We, oh, that's right. It's called, it's a video that's out there called Heroes of the Southern Cross. You might, you might see it on my Facebook page. It's been spread around a bit. I know it's been seen by um, the Trump family, believe it or not. Right. They've watched the Heroes of the Southern Cross. And it was myself and uh, and the other lads, you know, Johnny Larter and, and uh, I think Craig was in it and, and Alex and also um, um, Craig Kelly mm. was in it. Mm. And uh, we got quite emotional at the end and, and uh, I got everyone in tears and Craig Kelly was wiping the tears from his eyes. And um, he is a man of great spirit and great heart. And uh, yeah. so, you know, they're going to have enough members. They're going to have enough members to fill candidates in every electorate. Are, are you in touch with Craig? Yep. Can you put in a good word for me? I was texting him a while back and he said he wanted to come on my show. He knows who I am. He's been following my, my work for years. He's the one that got away. And it makes sense. He got super busy. Other stuff, crazy stuff started to happen. Uh, yep. That was when the SMS campaign went out from United Australia Party and blah, blah, blah. And yep. and we've kind of lost touch with each other since then. But I am dying to have Craig on a slow chat. Um, so if you could just slip him a good word on my behalf and remind him of that conversation, I'd be very, very grateful. I'd be very grateful. And, uh, and you know, the, and the other day I was at a at a gathering in my local town. There were 120 people had driven. Some of them had driven hours to get there, and we were, and they were talking about the the wonderful video of um, of Rod Cullerton defending that farmer. I don't know whether you saw it. Mm, the farmer was yeah. about to be repossessed, and Rod Cullerton stayed there and fought off the police and the sheriff, and the guy kept yeah. his land. Amazing. Everyone was talking about it. And while I was addressing the group, and they were they were all cheering for. For Rod, I got on the phone and called him, and he answered straight away. And I put him on speaker and held him up, and I said, "These people love you," and all that sort of stuff. It was a great moment. <laughs> yeah. um, and he he uh, so then then the other guy I've spent a bit of time with. Uh, I think we talked for nearly three hours. He does a bit of a, 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 a an audio podcast. Is um, mm. Senator Malcolm Roberts? Um, I have so much time like, for him. I have so much time oh, for him. Sorry, you, you you speak and then I'll I'll talk about him as well. We spent three days in a very small plane together. Did you? Yeah. So sorry, you you keep going and then I'll I'll tell my story. No, well, I I don't have much more to say other than I love the man's integrity. So the guys yeah. I'm talking about, Craig Kelly and Malcolm Roberts, they're all in different parties, and Rod Cullop and Jason Miles represent such integrity. The other one is Michael O'Neill from IMOP. Yeah. Right, the Independent Medical Options Party. I mean, yeah. he is a man of enormous integrity mm. uh, and a solid Christian as well. I, I've known Michael before he got into politics. Um, we're of the same faith, and he's just a beautiful man. And we are blessed with a, a cohort of choices to put these governments in their places at the next election. I tell you yeah. what, if you get if you get uh, United Australia and you get GAP. And I'm up and these others into a position of power. They could take mm. control of this government mm. uh, because the faith in the in the uh, four parties that have been running this place for the last few decades is just gone. Yeah. Um, you know, the federal government has allowed um, things to happen in Australia that uh, we can't point our finger at China or Myanmar or any of these other other countries at civil Not rights. Anymore. Rights. We can't. We have lost our moral integrity in that regard. And I've said a hundred times, if we put leaky boats on the beaches at the offshore detention centres and let everyone out, they'd all go back to where they came from. They yeah. wouldn't want to come and live in in Victoria yeah. or in Australia. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you know we've lost our way, and the way we've treated that uh, Sri Lankan family that have been in detention and and chopped and changed everywhere, and that yeah. from Billa Wheeler, and the town is begging for them to come back. For goodness' sake, Peter Dutton or whoever's running this now, just yeah. get over yeah. yourself. Yeah. And for, and start showing some humanity. That's not the yeah. spirit of Australia. Yeah. Look, yeah. I, just, just to, to, to speak on Malcolm Roberts, he and I have some very strong policy disagreements. Yeah. Um, but I will 100% vouch for and fight anybody who says otherwise for his integrity. Oh, This yeah. is a man who 
genuinely believes what he says and says what he believes. I spent three days in a plane with him, a small six-seater plane flying around the Murray-Darling Basin on a fact-finding mission. I had the pleasure of, of, you know, when you're in a small plane together, you've flown large planes, but you would have started flying small planes. And you can appreciate if if yep. you start in Albury and you head to South Australia and then you head into New South Wales and you head into Southern Queensland and then all the way back to Albury again, stopping ooh, probably 10 times, landing probably 10 times along the way, staying overnight for two nights, you get to know somebody, right? <laughs> when you're cooped up and you're just talking on the, you got the cans and the microphone and you're all talking to each other. Um, Malcolm Roberts is a man of absolute integrity and I will defend that to my death even though I have strong disagreements with some of One Nation's policies, not all, but some. Mm -hmm. And he is exactly the kind of person that we need more of in politics. When he listens, he listens and he's taking notes. And what became clear to me over three days was that as he was listening to somebody on day three, he was then in his mind cross-referencing that back with what someone told him on day one. And was asking me questions. I was there because I've spent years wrapped up in all the water stuff in the Murray-Darling Basin. And he would come back to me and he would say, okay, this person told me that, that person told me that. These can't both be true. What's going on here? And he would, you know, and I would break it down for him. Okay, from this person's perspective, this is what they see. From that person's perspective, that's what they see. But he remembered and he had his notes on what people had said to him. When he listens, he is listening like nobody else I've ever seen before. His attitude of service is a genuine attitude of service. When he stands up in in and makes a speech in Parliament, he always opens with, you know, uh, a servant of the people of, of Queensland and Australia, and he means it with every fibre of his being. He means it. The other party I want to throw into the ones that you were talking about there uh, is actually the Liberal Democrats. And these are the guys that if I was going to run for anybody, it, it would have been them. Uh, yep. I don't want to run for anybody <laughs> is, is, is the, the honest reality. I don't want to be in politics. That's crap. Um, but, um, but they are the people that, that I think, you know, and they've had a federal senator before in the form of David Lionhelm. They've got two upper house members in Victoria right now in the form of uh, David Limbrick and Tim Quilty, both of whom have been outstanding on all of this. Uh, Catherine Cumming has come into her own more recently from another party. I, I'll, or is she an independent? I, I don't recall. And there's a few liberal members that have started to say some good things, but honestly, I don't. I don't really put any faith in the Liberal National Party in Victoria or federally at anyway. all. Anyway, yeah, anyway, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, but what happened in Western Australia? They conceded defeat two weeks before McGowan even had the election. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, what a joke! What a joke! Um, yeah. So, so. <sighs> Elections are incredibly important. I want to talk about voting for a second. This is something that I bring up ad nauseum and I want to bring up again. And I actually need to correct myself because um, I was about to say people misunderstood. No, people didn't misunderstand me. I didn't say it correctly. I was talking about preferential voting and I didn't clarify that I was talking about in the Senate. In the Senate, when you've got the Senate ticket and there's like a billion different people, there's a hundred parties and, 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 and a thousand candidates, right? You're obliged to vote for, I believe it's six people. If you want to vote below the line, I believe you're obliged to vote for at least six of them. But read the instructions at, at polling day. People thought that I was talking about the lower house where you do have to vote for every single person in the lower house. And I didn't clarify that. So I apologize. When I talked about leaving the major parties off the ballot, I was I, I, I intended in my head I was talking about the upper house, but I never said that. Uh, so in the lower house, make sure you vote for everybody preferentially, but vote for all of the minor parties that you can possibly live with, even if you have policy disagreements. Trust me, I will be putting one nation ahead of any of the major parties. Why? Yeah. I have policy disagreements with them, but I have a lot more agreements with them than I do with any of the majors. And the majors have betrayed our trust. I'll be, voting, I'll be voting in the lower house. I'll be voting Liberal Democrats, number one, and then looking for who else is there. If UAP is there, they'll get my vote. If IMOP is there, they'll get my vote. If, if, if uh, Australia First is there, they'll get my vote. I will pass my vote down through all of these people before I vote for any of the major parties in the lower house. And in the upper house, I will pass my vote down through all of these parties, and then I will stop, and I will not allow it to go to the Liberals or to the Labor Party because they have not earned my vote. They do not deserve my vote. And closer to the federal election, so there should be a federal election somewhere between December and May. It's expected to be somewhere March to May. That's where it's most likely to happen. But it could happen maybe as early as December. And I will release videos on that topic. So, 
Sorry? Scott Morrison will need time to pack, so it's going to be a bit later. <laughs> it could be a little bit later. Look, some people are suggesting he'll try and get it in before Christmas uh, for his own tactical reasons. Maybe. I have no idea. But once that election gets called, I will release a video talking about how I will be voting. I can't tell you how to vote. It's a free country. You vote how you see best. But I'll be talking about what I'll be focusing on uh, prior to that election. But we need to yeah. use this preferential system that we have in the best way that we possibly can to get as many non-major lower house candidates and upper house candidates as we possibly can. And ideally, the situation that we want, uh, because I don't think we're going to be able to form government outside of Labor Greens slash Liberal Nationals. I, they, I would love to think that that could happen, but I, I don't think it, it can. Mm. Sorry? We need a balance of power. We need the balance of power. We need to make sure that in the lower house, which is where the prime minister and the premier of each state comes from, in the lower house, neither Labor Greens, which are a coalition, even though they don't call themselves that, or Liberal Nationals have a majority. They cannot form government without the help of some freedom-loving lower house members. And if we can achieve that at the next election, we can completely transform the future of this country. That's... That's what yeah. I'd be hoping for, Graham. Absolutely. I I, um, I was on on a group chat with uh, Monica and and several other influencers the other night. You were there, weren't you there? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yep. And, and, uh, and I raised the question to Monica. I've heard a rumor that um, that Clive Palmer is going to make UAP give their preferences to the Liberals. Now that was a rumor that's been going around. And Craig came on after, and I'm so glad he did because Monica said to him. Craig, there's, uh, there's been a rumour, and he said, categorically not. He said, our sole yeah. purpose is to get out every sitting member, get rid of a lot of them, except him. <laughs> and uh, he, no, he said, we, we're not about preferences. You have to make your choices below the line, and it's up yeah. to guys like you uh, who are doing these programs on a regular basis to educate. We're all yeah. going to need educating, and yeah. we need to spend our time positively to educate ourselves, I am I am very, very confident that the minor parties are going to kick some serious butt and yep. we're going to teach these these clowns a lesson in the majors. Um, yep. We have to. I mean, we cannot allow this ever to happen again in Australia. 100%. Listen, if you're in Victoria, I want you to I want you to put down whatever you're holding and focus on me for a second, okay? Because this is incredibly important. In Victoria, we need to get rid of Daniel Andrews. And think about what I said before about how Labor members hate him, but they don't want to get rid of him so close to an election. They don't want to be left carrying the can, right, for the next election, unless they realize that they're going to lose their seat, at which point maybe we can make things happen. The federal election, which will happen sometime between December and May, is our opportunity to make them realize that they are going to lose their seat if they don't move, if they don't do something. In that federal election, we need to make the minor parties gain so much ground against the federal government that our state government says, oh crap, if that happens at the state election, I'm out of a job. Each MP looking at the numbers in their electorate going, if that, if those numbers are repeated in the next state election, which by then might only be seven or eight months away, if those numbers are repeated, I'm toast. I lose my cushy job. If you want to get rid of Daniel Andrews, believe it or not, the federal election is the key to getting rid of Daniel Andrews. If we can show in the federal election a massive shift towards minor parties, then Labor MPs will think about making a move against Daniel Andrews. Rather than letting him fail at the election, they will think about making a move against him before then in the hope of saving their own seat. The federal election is the key to getting rid of Daniel Andrews. Okay? I'm going to talk a lot more about that as the federal election approaches, but I want you to log that in your brain. The federal election is the key to getting rid of Daniel Andrews. There's another point. My beautiful wife is is sitting in the bedroom watching this. Mm. Uh, hello, honey. I, I won't be long. No, I might be a bit longer. Yet. We're having a <laughs> might, might be a while. <laughs> might be a while yet. Uh, he's just opened another bottle of scotch, so I think we're in trouble. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she just came out and she said, "Don't be surprised if people who aren't vaccinated aren't allowed to vote." I mean, that's completely undemocratic. But in, in Victoria, yes. 
Yeah. So, so I expect that will happen. What will happen, because it would be undemocratic if they couldn't vote, what he will say is they have to vote by mail. If he gets this, ele- this, this legislation through that he's working on right now, then he will declare the election to be a public event that he can then regulate, and he will say, no, unvaccinated people are not allowed to show up to polling booths and have to vote by mail. And unfortunately, voting by mail uh, makes you much more vulnerable to corruption. There's, there's certain things that can happen when they're counting the mail-in ballots that can't really happen. It's harder to happen with the scrutineering that goes on on an election day. But let me also say this. If you want to make a difference without being public, without being the public face and, and risking all the blowback and, and the, 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 the attacks that can come with that, can I encourage you to do two things? Pick your favorite minor political party and become a paid member. I'm not going to tell you who that should be, but become a paid member of your favorite political party. And even if you don't do that, become a scrutineer. Get in touch with the Australian Electoral Commission or the Victorian Electoral Commission or whatever it may be for your particular state and become a scrutineer so that you can be standing there as votes are being counted and you can actually hold accountable anyone that tries to do anything dodgy with votes. That is a way that you can help without having to be Graham Hood, without having to be Topher Field. You can help by be becoming a paid member of political parties if that's what you want to do, standing on polling booths, handing out how to vote cards. It seems silly, but research shows that the vote will change by around about one and a half to two percent because they had someone on the booth handing out how to vote cards. That is massive. That's bigger than an advertising budget. You standing on a polling booth are worth tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in advertising. So can I encourage you, if you want to make a difference, but you don't want to be public about it, please do that. Well, I don't care what party it is, as long as it's not one of the major ones that is failing us. Not Labor, not Greens, not Liberals, not Nationals. Sideline all of those. Go and pay your money, become a member, and stand on a polling booth and hand out how to vote cards. And if you don't want to do that, volunteer and become a scrutineer so that you can at least make sure that the counting that is done in front of you is fair and democratic. These are things that you can do that will make a difference. And yeah, okay, you might say, well, what difference does one person on a polling booth make? Okay, only a little bit, but you're you're not alone. There's going to be other people doing the same thing. And if enough people do do that, then we can actually make sure that the elections are fair, that the count is correct, and the people who should win do win. These next elections are going to be incredibly important, at the very least, to send a message, at the very least, and and we all need to play our part in that. She just she just came out of the cave again. She said to be able to do all those things that, that Topher's talking about, you're still going to have to be vaccinated because you won't be allowed in there. You know what? That had not crossed my mind. Credit to your beautiful wife. Uh, oh, that had not crossed my mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, interesting. Okay. So if you're vaccinated, take a stand for those of us that, that are not. And I saw yeah, a question yeah, yeah. earlier about whether I'm vaccinated or not in, in all the comments. Uh, no, I'm not vaccinated. Uh, I, I don't volunteer for medical experiments of any kind. I'm in the control group. Any good medical experiment requires a control group. I'm in the control group. Uh, and I'm experiencing the consequences of that uh, as such as they are. Um, but okay, that's a good point. I, that had genuinely not crossed my mind. Um, so thank you for that. Thanks, Jella. Uh, yeah, if you're vaccinated, especially if you're vaccinated, if you've been bullied into being vaccinated, and, and yeah, I yeah. agree with what Graham said earlier, there is no judgment, okay? You yeah. need to do what you need to do in order to make your life work, okay? I was on a, I was on an Instagram chat with Carly um, earlier this week. I, I chat with her weekly. Uh, if you're not on Instagram, Topher Field on Instagram. Um, and, and we were talking about the fact that she's actually been bullied into having to be vaccinated. This is not a choice that she made for herself. She was bullied into it. And she had this incredible, she's a photographer. Photography is a very competitive world. And she was invited by some big brands to do photography for them. That is a career making opportunity, but she had to be vaccinated. And she was left with this awful choice. She has worked her ass off for years for an opportunity like this. And there is no guarantee that another one will come along. And so she, regretfully and feeling violated, 
made the choice that she's going to go and become vaccinated in order to in order to be able to take this opportunity uh, and and progress her career violated. in that way. And yeah. Yeah, she's violated absolutely. She's yeah. violated. She's 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 been abused. She's been yeah. abused into doing uh, into obeying the government, into obeying her abuser. And the yeah. And we talked about it and, and, and on that, on that um, Instagram live and we talked about it and, and talking about the fact that if someone, if you met someone and they had been a victim of abuse and they'd been handcuffed to a bed in someone's basement and they allowed, they ended up allowing and agreeing to allow their abuser to do horrible, awful, unthinkable things to them in return for a meal, in return for better conditions, in return for not being handcuffed, would you judge that person or would you judge their abuser? The you abuser. would judge their abuser. You would say the person that did that to you is beneath contempt. Yep. They are an animal. Uh -huh. And so if you have been bullied and abused into the to the point that you have to take this vaccine for whatever the reason, for whatever the rationale is, please know, that we are not judging you. I'm not judging you. Graham's not judging you. No one is judging you. We are no. judging your abuser. We are looking at the people that bullied you and cornered you and left you with no choice and saying those people are beneath contempt. But if you yep. want to get some revenge now that you are vaccinated, maybe think about signing up as a scrutineer and making sure that the election is fair and free and people's votes count. Maybe think about you know standing on a polling booth. That's a great point that probably unvaccinated people probably won't be able to do it. But if you're one of the people that has been bullied into this, you can get your revenge by doing something that I can't do. And that is scrutineering, standing on a polling booth, making that little difference. And if enough people do that, then we can send a message through the federal election that is going to have Labor MPs here in Victoria shaking in their boots. Couldn't agree more, mate. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Shouldn't we have a fight or something? A disagreement? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Listen, we're just going on three hours, and I, I've got to go into the studio tomorrow. I'm working with my cinematographer to set up the lighting, the the, uh, the haze machine. Yes, we're going to have some haze and some atmosphere. It's going to look amazing. When you see the set, I promise you, you're going to understand why I was so strict and demanding, and I had to have my set the way I had designed and envisioned that set in my mind. So tomorrow is when we do all that work. So I can't have a terribly late night tonight. So you know what? At three hours, I'm going to call it, Graham. I'm sorry. I'm going to I'm going to steal from you the opportunity to set a new record of more than four hours, and I'm going to call it at three hours. But I will admit that I'm the weak one. I'm the one calling it. You young blokes have got no ticker. Fair dinkum. You got no ticker. You I know, right? The country's in a mess. Right? <laughs> Too many cigars and too many bottles of scotch. That's your problem. That's yeah. No, that's you're, you're spot on. I'm not going to argue with you, Graham. I'm not going to argue with you, mate. This has been a pleasure. I, I cannot. Be, of it. I yeah. cannot begin to express to you how much I have appreciated, how much I have learned, uh, and how I don't know. I just I feel lifted as a result of our conversation, Graham. And I'm I'm so grateful to you. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for for uh, not not hoodies heroes, hoodies helpers. Thank no, you. Thank, thank Diana and the team, the wonderful team who are setting that up. Diana, well, thank and you to Diana and and the team. You guys are amazing. You guys are angels, and you're literally saving lives. So you thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Graham, don't underestimate the importance of a figurehead. Don't underestimate the importance of the big mouth. Uh, and and you know what? You are more than a mouth. You've shown tonight, you showed in your very first video that went viral, but you've certainly shown tonight there is genuine depth to you and, and you have wisdom of years that cannot be bought with money. It can only be bought with time. And, uh, and I am so deeply grateful to you that you share that wisdom with us and you help us uh, to, to have better perspective and, and to work through the issues and the challenges that we're facing. And I, I'm deeply grateful. So thank you. My pleasure, and, and uh, don't let me go without saying the serenity prayer, please. Let me go ahead. Yeah. And I want I want all of you to to think about the words I'm about to say because they're it's the prayer that guides people through addiction into a better life and restores broken lives. And uh, so, if you want to bow your heads, uh, please do. Mm. Dear Lord, please grant me the serenity 
to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one precious moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful, wretched world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you, God, will make all things right if we surrender to your will, not Daniel Andrews, so that we may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. And Lord, as Topher goes to bed tonight to embark on a massive project tomorrow, we pray that that project will really kick some goals. Mm. That you will use that project, Lord, to set your people free, to set your people in Victoria free, to set your Australian people free. And we mm. ask you, Lord, to be at the front of our battle line, that we walk behind you close enough to hear your instructions and close enough to be under your umbrella wearing the armour of God. Mm. This we pray, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Graham, I have nothing more to add. Thank you. Tonight has been.